Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today I found my girlfriend cuddling with her male best friend. I've been dating my girlfriend for six months now, and I wanted to surprise her on her birthday, which was this month. So I talked to another friend of hers where they were supposed to have a birthday party for her. I coordinated with her, but my flight was delayed and I reached there at 3 a.m. in the morning. I texted her friend and asked her to keep my girlfriend away from the door so I could sneak in. When I got there, her friend met me outside and gave me a look. At that time, I just thought she was tired, so I asked her where my girlfriend was and she answered in the upstairs bedroom. She then put her hands on my shoulder and said, all the best. Again, I thought it was weird, but I was excited to see my girlfriend, so I brushed it off. Anyways, I ran upstairs and I found my girlfriend cuddling with her best friend, who's a dude. They were in deep sleep and I was so shocked that I ran out of there. Her friend saw me and said that she was sorry. I got a cab and I went back to my place. My girlfriend has been calling me ever since, but I blocked her everywhere. I don't know what to do next. Should I talk to her or just chalk it up to a lesson learned and move on? What's the best way forward from here? I'm so confused, so some help would be appreciated. Thank you. If they were truly just platonic, her roommate would not have handled it this way. She sent you up to save you the pain of this relationship continuing as your girlfriend is a cheater. Better for you to find out what she's like now rather than later. You dodged a major bullet, and while it may hurt right now, it will heal faster than letting it fester. So get over her and enjoy your life. You'll find someone better eventually. No need to doubt yourself over her. You sound super insecure. I cuddle with guy friends all the time, and if a boyfriend ever had a problem with that, I'd dump him. Instead of actually talking to her about it like an adult, you throw a fit. I think she's the one dodging the bullet, and you should therapy for your insecurities. Just because a girl cuddles with a guy friend does not mean that she's cheating on you. My husband just admitted to having an affair and getting someone else pregnant. My husband and I got married three years ago. When I was a teenager, I was told that due to medical complications, I may never be able to have kids. But after two years of trying and fertility treatments, I'm now halfway through my pregnancy with our miracle baby. Unfortunately, because of some complications, I had to cut back on my hours at work. It's very physical. My husband offered to pick up more hours to compensate, so he's been working a lot more the past two months and coming home later. I couldn't see that anything was amiss. Things were the same as they'd always been. He always brings home flowers, food, and things for the baby. Coffee. He's always sending me thoughtful and loving texts throughout the day. The gaps where he was unreachable were explainable. But this morning, he sat me down and gave me news that rocked me. He told me that he's been having an affair for the past six weeks and that his affair partner just found out that she's pregnant. He says that if she decides to keep the baby, she's going to raise it by herself and that they mutually agreed to end the relationship already. He wants to make things right. I don't know how things can ever be made right again. He just wants to move on from what he's calling his transgression. How do I ever forgive him? How do you deal with the unthinkable? How do I learn to live with the idea that my child's sibling might be out there somewhere someday? Most importantly, how do I learn to move on like he wants me to? Edit. I have an OB appointment for unrelated medical reasons tomorrow at which I will make sure to request extensive testing. I have plans to meet with a lawyer on Monday. I'm talking to my sister to see if I can stay with her. My relationships with much of my family are not good, but I have a pretty positive relationship with her. I will not be seeking other options other than having my baby due to being pretty far along, and I've been told in the past I would not conceive. Regardless of what my husband has done, I love my baby. Edit 2. I saw my OB on Friday and will hopefully have some test results. Fingers crossed everything's negative within the next few days. I'll meet up with my lawyer tomorrow and go from there. My sister advised me to stay in the house that my husband and I co-own until I talk to a lawyer. This has been such an emotionally harrowing time for me. He's acting like everything is normal. All I want to do is sleep. I keep telling myself that it'll all be over soon. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be okay having a baby with a man who just abandoned one. OP. I keep coming back to this. It sounds like she's on the fence about the pregnancy, which is ultimately 100% her choice but the ease with which he's willing to take the stance of just forgetting the whole thing happened is hard for me. I'm more than halfway through my pregnancy, 23 weeks, so I'm in a different position. I was thinking the exact same thing. I'm not getting that he has any fear of losing you. Why? Either he thinks you're easy to control or not that bright, 
or desperate to stay his wife. Which is it? Why isn't he begging you to stay with him? Why does he feel you'll just go along with forgetting that he cheated on you? OP, I think he knows that my initial reaction was going to be that, yes, we could fix things, or I would agree to make things right. I think he knows that I have so much invested, emotionally, in this relationship. He is my first real love, my first, well, everything really, and that I'm more likely to fight for what we have than to give it up. Even I'm surprised at how conflicted I feel. Update. First off, she decided not to keep her baby, which was confirmed to me by her. Talking to her was really weird, and she didn't answer a lot of questions that I had for her. This is a person who knows me and has met me a number of times, and I just don't get it. The motivations on both sides don't make any sense to me, and I don't know if they ever will. It helped to learn that there was no romantic feelings, but it was still confusing, especially since I perceive my husband and I to have a healthy love life, and I don't get what's fun or exciting about leaving the boundaries of your marriage. We are in therapy, separately and together. Going separately is helping me to sort out a lot of my own feelings, but I think that going together is essentially one way or another as well. He has been cooperative and participating in therapy. I'm hoping that we can figure out at least some of these things. We've had a lot of conversations about why it won't be easy for me to just forgive this and why I need answers and changes in behavior, and I do feel that I've been heard. Divorce is not completely off the table, but it's a hard situation to be in, especially in a vulnerable state like being pregnant. I've consulted with a lawyer and made my parameters clear to him, but for now, I want to try to work things out. I know this isn't the update that a lot of people hoped for, but for me, I think this is the right choice. Again, divorce is not off the table. What is off the table right now is trying to make a decision that will affect my life greatly when I'm already in an extremely vulnerable position. Update. Six months ago, my life was the best it had ever been. My husband and I had just found out we were pregnant. Our relationship seemed happy and strong as ever, just on top of the world. So I found out that shortly before we got married, he had had another affair that I never found out about before. I was devastated beyond devastation. He said some things to me that I will never forget or be able to forgive. So I went into preterm labor at 26 weeks, which they were able to stop, but after four weeks, I'm still having a lot of complications and I may have to deliver the baby early. My family has been nasty and uncooperative since we fought. He hasn't come to see me in the hospital even once in four weeks. My life was incredible before all of this, before I knew about all of this. I wish I could go back to that. The time I was petty during my boss's divorce. Around the end of 2017, my boss's wife went through a midlife crisis and decided to have an affair and move out of their house. Divorce proceedings initiated shortly after. In the following March, there was an incident between the two of them that necessitated court intervention and for them to meet some requirements as a result. One of those requirements was her being required to walk around the house and make a list of all the items that were hers. Cue pettiness on her part. Boss's lawyer stated that, In my 20 years of law practice, I have never seen a list this petty. Half of the dish towels, half of the paper plate holders, half of the pots, the curtains in the lounge, etc. You get the idea. She made sure that she got half of everything. However, my boss did not allow her to come into the house herself to pack as she had spent the previous five months stealing out of the house at every opportunity and he didn't trust her to pack only her belongings. So he made me do it. Small company, nothing else really for me to be doing. This is where the pettiness comes in. She requested one saucepan. I shook both and one had a loose handle. She got that one. She asked for the curtains in the lounge. She didn't ask for the curtain hooks. So I took all of those out. Half of the dish towels? She got all the grouty, mismatched ones, not the nice red set. Half of the containers in the storage room? Never specified she wanted the contents, so she got empty containers. I did this for the entire list, making sure that I was as petty as possible when packing up the house. The result. Part 1. Once she took all of her stuff, she sent a very long letter via her lawyer, stating that what she received was not what was listed in her belongings. We painstakingly went through the entire list, explaining that she received exactly what was written on her list and we couldn't possibly be at fault since she wasn't specific enough. Their divorce was finalized at the end of 2019. Occasionally, we will still get the stray email saying we need to return items to her that weren't provided back in 2018. It makes my petty heart burn bright, knowing that she tried to be a jerk about taking things and I turned it back on her and ruined it by being extra petty. Edit. I did not behave like this in a vacuum. 
I did not do over a kindly woman that I didn't know. No, I'm not dating or married to my boss. I can't believe I have to say this, but not every woman in a divorce is the good party. Divorce brings out the worst in people. I'm my boss's personal assistant, and it's my job to read his emails. I won't be responding to any further comments, mostly for my own sanity. I've answered most of the questions in other comments, and I want to go outside and touch grass for a bit. You need to leave my car alone, if you say so. This is not my story, but my friend Adam's. Adam is a retired police officer, and this takes place in the mid-90s, back when Adam was a cop, maybe a year or two into his service. At the time this story takes place, a firebug had targeted several businesses over the course of a three-month period. The fires were put out, but they were getting bigger and bigger, causing thousands of dollars in damage. Everyone was on edge, and the police were patrolling the area every night to try and catch Mr. Firebug. On this particular night, in the middle of February, Adam and his partner, Rick, drew the short stick and thus were assigned to patrol part of the area. While on patrol, he notices a classic Mercedes-Benz pulling up to a house and a familiar lady dressed in a thick fur coat steps out. He groans. It's the wife of a local business owner that every officer in this town has had the displeasure to ticket for various parking and traffic violations. It would have been fine if she were a nice lady or something, but no, her three default sentences were, Don't you know who I am? Where's your manager? And I'll have your job. Seriously, she was a Karen before Karens were even a thing. Rick points out to Adam that Karen had parked right by a fire hydrant. Par for the course. Adam gets ready and steps out of the squad car. Good evening, Mrs. Karen, Adam says. What are you doing here? Karen bellowed. Adam guessed that's the Karen's versions of hello. Working the beat. You do know you're parked next to a fire hydrant. So? Karen said. I'm suggesting you move it before I write you a ticket. I'm not in the mood for extra paperwork tonight. Listen, you need to leave my car alone or I'll have your job. With that, Karen storms off to the house, goes inside and slams the door. Adam thought, if you say so, and proceeded to check the outside of the car for any more violations and wishing that being a jerk was a federal offense. As he's putting the ticket under the windshield wiper, the call everyone's been dreading comes on the radio. A fire alarm has been triggered. The address? Right across the street. Adam looks over at the building and can see a faint orange glow in the window on the second floor. He reports the glow. He and Rick get ready in case Mr. Firebug decides to cross their path. Several officers arrive and set a perimeter around the building as the glow gets brighter and brighter. Unfortunately, by the time the fire department gets there, flashover happens and all of the windows on the second floor get blown out. It was so hot that Adam felt sweat form on his face. The fire department needs to get the hoses set up, but Karen's car is in the way. Using safety hammers, they break the windows and run the hoses through, getting everything set up in record time. During all of the chaos, Karen comes out and she sounds like a banshee that had swallowed an air raid siren. She runs over and tries unhooking the hose from the hydrant. What are you doing? My car is ruined. It took two officers to restrain her and bark at her to go inside and let everyone do their jobs. She actually listened and returned inside. Adam spent the rest of his shift helping with the fire and investigation. It was close to dawn when he returned to the station to finish up. All he wanted was to go home and crawl into bed. That's when his supervisor calls Rick and him over and reports that Karen reported several thousand dollars worth of damage. Not only had her windows been broken, but water had gotten in and froze because it was the middle of February. The supervisor asked them what happened and they reported everything. Fortunately, the dash cam caught a recording of the event. The supervisor shook her head, laughed, and said, Well, you had nothing to do with the car getting damaged, so I consider this closed. A few weeks later, they caught the firebug, a different business owner who was trying to commit insurance fraud. He figured that if several other buildings caught fire, nobody would think he was responsible for burning down his own business. Unfortunately, Karen never did seem to learn her lesson, so she was back to racking up tickets and being a thorn in the police side. She did have to pay for the damages and the ticket that Adam gave her. Am I the jerk for asking my wife for a paternity test because she cheated a few years ago? Me, 32, and my wife, who's 30, have been married for 8 years now. 3 years ago, she cheated with a friend of hers, and after some time, we managed to reconcile. She found out she was pregnant a few days ago, and while my initial reaction was happiness, then the thought that it could be someone else's crawled into my mind. The thought... She's done it before, popped into my head. 
When I asked her to take a test and explain my reasoning, we had a huge fight. She said that I shouldn't hold that against her after all the work we've done to repair our relationship. I still feel strongly about the paternity test. Update. Things to clear up. After my wife cheated, we had counseling, and it's been a hard road for both of us, but we managed to build something new, so to speak. Also, we weren't actively trying for a baby. We both wanted kids, but since she cheated on me, that wasn't something we thought we should do for a while, at least not before we reconciled. Also, I tried to be as tactful when I brought up the paternity test, but I think tactfulness can only go so far when essentially accusing your wife of potentially cheating on you. It went like this. Honey, we need to talk about the baby. What's wrong? Look, I need some reassurance. I love you, but I can't just shake this thought off my mind. What thought? I'm worried that it's not mine. After that, things got louder and we had a fight. Update. After our fight, I slept in the other room, and we didn't really talk for a while. We waved goodbye when we went to work, and we had small talk about our days, but didn't really address what we fought about. She eventually came to me and apologized for her reaction. She says she understands why I asked her for the test, and she got mad because she thought the whole cheating thing was over and we wouldn't need to ever bring it up again. She said she was mad because this made her realize that this is something that will always be part of our relationship's history, and it reminded her of how much of an effect this had on me and how much she hurt me. She told me she was mad at herself. She says she hates the fact that she gave me a good reason to ask for it. We simply hugged it out after that. She agreed to take a paternity test, but from some research that we've done, it seems to be a bit early for one, but we'll schedule it later on. I'll be honest, I think the test is just a formality for now, but I still want it for my own peace of mind. I do love my wife and want us to start building our family. What are you going to do if it's not yours? If the kid isn't mine, then I'll leave. I made my mind up on that before I even asked her for the test. Update. So we waited a few weeks before the test and the results came back in. And yes, the baby is in fact mine. Besides that, there's not much to tell. My wife has been very accommodating and has not gotten angry at me over this again. We're both very excited to be parents. Also, to those of you who asked me to wait until the baby is born, how am I supposed to do that? Not only do you think I should lie to my wife, but also you expect my wife to not notice the birth certificate lacks my signature? This is sad. He still can't fully trust his wife. The baby will make it more complicated. I gave it another two years. Excited to be parents? This whole relationship sounds like a ticking time bomb. It will probably go off again. Good luck to your kid. No man is ever the jerk for asking for a paternity test. They should never be put in the position to have to ask. A paternity test should be standard. The biggest part of this is it just shows that no matter how much counseling, how much time, and how much work you do to repair a relationship after cheating, it never ever completely goes away. That little voice is always back there to remind you that they have proven to you they will cheat and since it has happened before, it could happen again. I was told that our company's Christmas party's theme is ugly sweater when it wasn't. I work as a preschool teacher. My company has about 20 people, counting internships, and hosted a Christmas party at a local restaurant yesterday. I've worked there since May. Weeks ago, I was told that the theme for the party is ugly sweater, which is fantastic since I really enjoy wearing those. But to top it off, I ordered a knitted dress in the style of an ugly sweater and some thermo thighs. I was excited and even showed some people screenshots of the dress, to which they all responded positively. Yesterday evening, I arrived at the restaurant and was greeted by a very formal office look among my coworkers. Small black or red dresses, formal jackets, skirts, white button-down shirts, high heels, and me wearing my knitted dress in the middle of it all. I felt underdressed at best until I tried to ask a new colleague about the dress code. She started working just three weeks ago and she told me it was business, but people assured her everyone knew so she didn't need to write it out in our WhatsApp group where I could have seen it. Through snippets I got from many of my conversations, I learned that only I, the one who wears ugly sweaters to work, was told about this theme and one colleague literally asked my boss if she doesn't pay me enough for nice clothes. On Monday work will start again and I have no idea on where to find the courage to go. My husband wants our baby's name to match the names of our other kids. My husband Jack, fake name, and I have been together for four years and we're expecting a baby girl due in February. My husband already has two boys from his previous marriage who are named after fictional characters that he and his previous wife were big fans of, and for the sake of this post, I'll name them Chandler and Joey. 
When we found out we were expecting a girl, he suggested we pick a name that is also from the show and suggested Rachel. I vetoed it because I wasn't a fan of the name. It's not actually Rachel, so don't be offended. Rachel's of the subreddit. He told me he wasn't as a big of a fan of the other names on the show, so I told him it didn't have to be from the show. But he believed that since the boys were both named after characters from the show, it would make sense to name our daughter after someone from the show too. I told him I don't like the name Rachel, but if he thought of a different character whose name I liked, I would consider it. He said he probably wouldn't, but fine, and I thought that was that. Come to today. I check my Facebook while on break at work, and I see that my mother-in-law has posted, Baby Rachel, due February 2024. And I hit the roof. I considered leaving work because I was so angry that I managed to finish my shift without hurting anybody. When I got home, Jack was already there, so I asked him why his mom thinks the baby is going to be named Rachel, and he told me that his mom asked about it and it was the name that he wanted. He said he thought I would learn to love it, and if he told his mom, there wouldn't be any way to change it now. I have a tendency to avoid contacting people when they're wrong, so he knew I would absolutely hate telling his mom that Rachel wasn't the name. He also said that the baby might feel left out if she's not named after a character from the show. I think after this, I hate the name Rachel even more. I don't know why he can't understand that I don't like the name and I don't want to pick it. I looked at the characters from the show as well after our initial conversation and there were some names I actually liked. So Reddit, how do I get my husband to agree to a different name? How do I get him to stop telling people our baby's name is going to be something it's not? How do I tell my husband's family plus everyone that saw my mother-in-law's Facebook post that the name he told them is not the name. You need to woman up and tell everyone yourself. Stop letting others walk all over you. It's now your job to stand up and protect your kid and be careful with the birth notice they give you from the hospital. That's all a married man needs to register his child. So if you're worried he'll take the paper and go alone to the registrar and name your daughter Rachel, then make sure he doesn't get his hands on that bit of paper. Also, personally, I would post under mother-in-law's post, lol, that's not the name we've chosen, and leave it at that. Am I the jerk for breaking up with my pregnant girlfriend because I don't want to be a father? I, 25 male, had been with my ex, 23 female, for a little over 3 months. I always took all the precautions necessary. She was on birth control. I wanted to avoid having a baby. I've known for a long time that I don't want to have any kids of my own. I find them annoying and they would severely limit my ability to do things I enjoy. Traveling, outdoor stuff, etc. Unfortunately for me, she's now pregnant. The first thing I did was suggest not having it. I offered to pay for her flight and hotel and I told her I'd be happy to come with her to get it done. I have a stable job and I make good money, so it wouldn't be too much of a hit for me. She works as a receptionist and doesn't make a lot, so I figured it would be better for me to pay. That's when she told me she was hoping to keep it and that she wanted me to help her raise the kid as its father. I have no intention of being a father. Beyond just my dislike of kids, I'm not ready for that. I made it very clear that I didn't want the baby, but she kept insisting that I'd have a change of heart once it's born and to just try it out. After a long exchange, I told her that if she intended to keep the baby, I would not act as a father. I broke up with her and told her that I would pay child support once it's born but that I expect her to respect my wishes and keep the kid away from me. Since then, she's been frantically texting me, begging me to come back and telling me she'll forgive me. She sent me voicemails crying. It does hurt to see, but I haven't responded. The other day, she texted me, saying how she can't raise the kid alone and how I'm basically forcing her to not have it by just leaving. She ended the text, begging me to talk again. I certainly feel crappy. I really liked her and we had a good relationship before this, but I just don't want to be a father. I'm already bitter about the fact that I'll have to pay child support for 18 years, which will somewhat limit me financially. I also feel it isn't right for a parent who doesn't want their kid to be involved. I just end up taking it out on them, which I feel isn't right. With all this said, I came here to ask, am I the jerk? I certainly feel like one, but I also stand by what I said. Edit. On the topic of having vasectomy, I tried. I met with a doctor last year and asked about getting one done, but he refused and said every doctor he knows won't do it until I'm at least 30. Update 1. I've hired one of the better family court lawyers in my state. She has someone representing her pro bono. It has been made clear to my ex and her representative that she's not to contact me personally and that all contact will go through my lawyer from now on. A paternity test is scheduled for next Wednesday. 
I don't know how long it will take to get the results, but the test is happening. If the kid is mine, we will go to court to determine child support payments and will set up the process for me to sign away my rights. On providing emotional support and getting back together with the ex. I don't want to give her emotional support and lead her on. If I'm around, she'll think I plan to get back together and be a present father, which I don't want. She should know I don't want the kid. That way, she's more likely to go through with not having it or adoption. I also don't want to be present for the birth for similar reasons. Plus, I'm pretty certain that even if I did change my mind on the kid, I wouldn't want to be with her. She expects me to get back together with her to raise the kid. But if I did end up seeing the kid and wanting her, I'd have to go through some annoying legal procedure to try and secure joint custody or something. This is a mess in so many ways that it isn't worth suffering through. I'm still certain I don't want the kid, but if I suddenly changed my mind to want the kid and then didn't get any custody, that would be pretty depressing. I'd rather just stay unattached and deal with any regrets I have later. About my parents, yes, they want grandkids. They've been hounding me ever since I turned 20 about when I'm going to give them grandkids. I've already told them I don't want kids and my sister's not going to be having any, so they're disappointed at this point. If they found out about the kid and that I was leaving, they would be furious, so I'm just not telling them. About how I'll feel in the future, I honestly cannot say 100%. I know that right now I 100% don't want kids, and I'm going off that feeling to assume how I'll feel in the future will be the same. Everyone lives with some level of regret, so I've come to peace with the idea that if I end up regretting this, I'll just have to move on and live with that like everyone else. If for some reason I felt regret, I wouldn't try to contact the kid, I just keep it to myself and keep chugging along like usual. If the kid does find me one day, I'll just be honest depending on how I'm feeling. Either, I was 25 and I didn't want kids and I still don't, sorry, or I was 25 and I thought I didn't want kids, I wasn't ready. It's been one of the biggest regrets of my life and I'm sorry, depending on how I'm feeling, most likely the former. I don't know what gave you the impression that I've softened to the idea of having kids. I still firmly don't want any. I just feel pity for the kid because it's not really their fault. I don't exactly feel good about leaving the kid on a moral level, but on a more personal of what is best for me, I feel very confident in leaving. It's certainly a selfish decision, but I've been upfront with the fact that I'm a selfish person. I feel bad about it, but I'm putting myself and my own personal needs first in this situation by doing what I think is best for me. I feel for this woman, but this is a three month relationship and she's devastated that this man doesn't wanna be a father? It would be so much worse having him around when he's going to be angry, bitter, and resentful. Everything about this sucks, but talking him into it is the last thing she will want in five years. She sounds completely delusional, as she hasn't heard anything that he said. They only dated three months. He broke up with her, and she thinks he's going to propose? Every time there's a post from a mom whose partner very clearly has no interest in being a dad, but she plans to stay with him anyway, for the kids, People correctly tell her what a terrible idea that is. But here's this guy doing everything in his power to prevent that exact scenario from playing out and people are losing their minds. Being raised by a single parent who loves and is committed to the kid is so much better for them than being raised in a two-parent household where one of the parents does not want to be there. I was a single mom at 20 and it was so much better than the co-parenting crap that some of my friends and family members had and still have going on. She'll get the child support from him that's more than what most single parents get. My own kid's biological father never paid a cent. She'll manage, if she can get over the delusion that biological dad wants anything to do with her and the baby. The first three years are kind of horrible, but they are with or without a partner. But it gets easier and easier as time goes on, and I haven't had any regret of my decision to keep my baby. Imagine a world where people got to know each other very well through long-term relationships before bringing babies into the world. You know what they say on Reddit, Karen. This ain't the 50s no more. Oh, don't remind me. I hate when they say that. Am I the jerk for telling my mother-in-law to get out of my house and stay at a hotel? My wife, 43 female, and I, 40 male, have been married for 18 years, and for the entirety of our marriage, I've had a great relationship with her parents. Both of them were Marines, and so was I, so we get along from the get-go. My mother-in-law lives in California, where I met my wife, and we live in Florida now. My wife is very close to her family, which is foreign to me. My family was never really close. My dad is a textbook covert narcissist and my mom always went with what he said. So because I wouldn't put up with his BS, I was the black sheep for a while. Mother-in-law was always welcome over and I even paid for her to fly here to surprise my wife once or twice. 
The only downfall is when she would come, she would stay for a month or two, but it never caused a problem until last year. Incident Last June was my oldest daughter's sweet 16, so my mother-in-law came out in May to help plan the party, and as usual, she stayed with us. We have a big enough house, but my wife's cousin is also staying with us while she goes to school, so it was a little cramped to say the least. Anyway, she cooked, cleaned, and helped out with groceries and even our laundry. It was great for the first couple of months, but then August rolled around and she became snippy, and her not-so-nice side started to show. She started complaining about little things and started moving things and rearranging things to suit her. We just brushed all that off. I started getting irritated when she and my wife kept bugging me about upgrading my TV. I bought a 55-inch Vizio LED in 2009 when they first started becoming affordable, and it still works great. I'm a simple guy. My pride and joy, other than my daughter's, is my 73 Jeep, which I restored on my own. Anyway, I finally just said to heck with it and let her do it. Fast forward a few weeks, and she came home from grocery shopping one day and immediately started on us. She said she texted my wife and daughter to open the garage for her, but my daughter wasn't home and my wife's phone was on silent. We brushed it off and helped her bring the groceries in. Then she saw a dish on the kitchen counter that was dirty and not put in the sink, and she started complaining about how our kids don't do enough and we aren't raising them right. That's when I lost it. She and I started on each other while my wife sat in the other room and didn't say a word. Her two 30-plus-year-old sons live with her, so I went off. My daughters are A and B honors students in high school and are already either working or playing sports all the time. Finally, I told her if she doesn't like how we live and raise them, she can get out and stay at a hotel. She went to a hotel two days later, and I haven't heard from her since. I texted her on Christmas, New Year's, her birthday, and other times, just saying I love her and I hope she's doing well. She hasn't responded once. Am I the jerk for going off on her, or was I right for standing my ground? Not the jerk. Mother-in-law needs to understand that even if she gets to stay for several months, she's still a guest in your house and should behave like a guest, not like she owns the place. She probably feels you owe her an apology, which you don't, at least not unless she's willing to apologize too, and you have made the first step to patch things up several times. How does your wife feel about the whole situation, and is her mom still talking to her? OP my wife took her side and said I should have handled it better. I agree, but it kind of bugs me that she didn't say anything to her. They still talk on a regular basis. I think I'd be bugged too. It's her mom. She should have handled it before it became an issue. But to be honest, it sounds like mother-in-law is just punishing herself by this point. If she wants to keep doing that, then that's on her. As long as she's not cutting off your wife as well. Am I the jerk for letting my wife do 7 hours of cooking by herself to prove a point? My wife is a neurologist. Once a month, we have a tradition where we and four other families we are friends with from her work gather in our house for dinner. This month was our turn to host. Usually I cook all the meals at home because my wife is an incompetent cook, although she claims she's an amazing cook. When she cooks, she would crank up the heat to the max and claim that doing this makes the meals cook faster and that it doesn't make a difference in the taste. It does. Friday night, I was doing prep work on the vegetables since I was going to be cooking for around 7 hours yesterday. I was almost done when my wife came into the kitchen complaining that I was wasting my time and that I should be helping with the kids. I got annoyed. We've had this fight for years. If I cooked something simple, then for the next 4 months, she would nag me for weeks after each dinner with her friend how I embarrassed her. This time, I wasn't in the mood for fighting so I wrote out the entire menu with the schedule of when each dish had to be cooked. The menu was traditional homemade bread, four dips, two platters of cured meats and sausages for the appetizers. For the main course, there was lasagna and chicken skewers with an Indian marinade and two salads, green salad and cabbage with carrots. For dessert, there was a New York cheesecake and a lemon tart with Swiss meringue. There are two options for each because one of the husbands is lactose intolerant and we will seem cheap if we only had one option my wife's words. When I was done, I called her parents and had them fake an emergency. Yesterday, they called and said that a pipe burst and they wanted my help. Since my wife is competent and can do everything by herself, I took the kids with me to fix the pipe and I let her cook. I spent the day resting while pretending to fix the pipe and my parents were playing with the kids. An hour and a half before dinner, I took the kids home so we can get ready. As I imagined, my wife did a horrible job. Either the food was raw, burnt, or a combination of both. Her friends probably went to McDonald's after that dinner, 
because we have a lot of scraps left over. Now she's singing a different song and saying that I abandoned her when I was the one that knows how to cook and she doesn't and blames me for the whole fiasco. I still haven't told her the truth and I'm not planning to actually. This is why I made a new account, but I wanted to know if I was the idiot in the situation because she still hasn't learned her lesson and still blames me. I do everything she wants, but I'm the bad guy. And if I let her do things how she wants to do them, I'm still the bad guy. Sounds like you at least learned that you're always going to be the bad guy. Now, it's time for you to figure out if you want to continue living that way and what to do about it. Not the jerk for what you did, as everyone reaches a breaking point. I didn't appreciate what my husband did. I learned after the divorce. Some people don't see their wrong until it's over. I'm in the process of ending my 22-year marriage. The last 12 years, I held on to hope that she would see value and appreciate me for the things I do and did. I raised our kids. I built our home. I repaired our cars, mowed lawns, prepared taxes, managed finances, worked full-time, and the list goes on and on. I love your comment, but I am past believing that she will ever acknowledge even a minor percentage of the things I do and did. I, along with four different marriage therapists, tried to get her to see my worth, but it was for nothing. She hates me more today than ever before. I think she's about to figure out how the world really is. Stepdad unearthed my time capsule. When the clock hit midnight on the year 2000, all of the members of my family and extended family were there. We all signed a paper and each put something into a time capsule. Shortly after, my grandfather passed from a brain tumor. I was nine at the time and my grandmother and I buried the time capsule behind the headstone at the cemetery. She told me to take it out in 10 years and have a look. No one else was there for that. I don't remember much of what was in there because I was so young. 2010 came and went and I didn't feel like taking it out yet. Not much had happened in 10 years, so I wanted to wait longer. Fast forward to 2022. My grandmother passed after living a long and full life. I disclosed to my family about the time capsule when we were at the graveyard and it seemed like my stepdad took interest. Parents were divorced and mom married him in 2008. I confirmed it was still there by poking a small wooden stake in the ground and poked around until I hit something solid. Decided it was still too early and wanted to wait longer. Today I got a picture in the family chat showing him unearthing the time capsule my mom and him took a trip to the cemetery for. I was upset and I still haven't responded. I don't know how to go about this. I don't know if I should tell him how much it meant to me to be the one to take it out or if I should just brush it off. It's one of those things I think about every once in a while and I get more excited as time goes on. I don't even remember what I put in there. Could have been a toy car or whatever, but I don't know. Am I the jerk for being upset about this? Thank you in advance. You're not the jerk for having the feelings that you have, but you could be the jerk depending on how you handle and express those feelings. From here on out, I'd focus on what you want to do to get out of the situation now. Do you want to see everything that was in the time capsule? Or would you like them to re-wrap it up and you can have a surprise later on? OP. My stepdad and I have a great relationship and he's been there for me. I don't think he intended to cause harm or anything. I just think curiosity got the better of him. Yeah, I'd like to see everything in there now. What's done is done and I don't feel like turning this into a mess will make anything better in the long run. I don't want them to rebury it. I think I was more excited to go there eventually and unearth it myself. It's in another state. Update. I was a mess for a few days. I was trying to figure out why it bothered me so much that he did that without my permission. There's so much hurt going on recently in the world, and this was such a small thing in the big picture. But I've been waiting for that moment most of my life, and it was taken away from me. I'm a very calm person, and it takes a lot to get to me. I don't know if it was the sum total of stressors in life and anger that I've bottled up over the years, but I was honestly considering calling off Thanksgiving with them over this. Crazy. So basically, I sent a text to my stepdad saying that I was very upset that he took it out of the ground without my permission. Instead of apologizing, he said he thought I would be happy that he found it and was just trying to locate it for me. I knew exactly where it was since I was nine and I never asked him for help finding it. I told him that I was not happy about it at all and that it meant a lot to me and the moment has been ruined. He then told me that he will put it exactly where it was and in his words, no harm, no foul. He didn't apologize at this point so I decided to not reply and continue stewing. I just got a text from him saying that he sincerely apologizes for what he did and that his intention was to map out exactly where it was for me to find it in the future. When he took it out of the ground, he found that the seal had been corroded and sand and dirt was inside, so he was going to take it out because it had been compromised. 
I need to let go of the feelings I had over this. I have no idea why it brought me from 0 to 10 so fast. I'm going to forgive him and let it go. I'm only hurting myself and my relationship with my stepdad by blowing this up. However, I will not be disclosing anything like this to him again. My sweet wife was so supportive and said that we can make our own time capsule for our daughter, born this year, to dig up years from now. That made it much better for me. Thank you all for your support. Am I the jerk for telling my father's affair partner that she married him and she can take care of him now? My father was not a very warm and caring father when my siblings and I, all in our 20s now, were young. I'm the youngest and I was only 8 when we all found out that he was having an affair with the woman he worked with. The affair only came out because the affair partner grew tired of our father staying married to my mom and showed no signs of being willing to divorce mom for her. So she took measures into her own hands and confronted mom with the truth. My siblings and I were all home at the time. It blindsided my mom significantly because while she knew our father worked a lot, he had always been attentive as a spouse to her and he could play pretend that he was invested in his kids. My mom's marriage to him fell apart and she moved out of his house with us and we started anew. My father fought for shared custody. I often wonder if this was to punish her or us or something, because it's not like he had any role in our lives at all, but he was awarded shared custody. His affair partner threw herself into this role of stepmom, and she acted like she was some new person who had no bad history with us or our family. She even ignored the fact she destroyed our mom's heart right in front of us. We did not like her, and within two years, she told our father she no longer wanted us around anymore, because all we did was bully her and made her feel like she was some unimportant mistake that he made. And she was also bothered by the fact none of us would acknowledge her as our father's wife or our stepmom. When asked, we would always say she was our father's affair partner. This wasn't something she wanted following her around or thrown in her face. So we had no contact with our father for more than a decade. I'm 22 now. Recently, the affair partner made contact to inform us that our father had suffered several health complications and he's now ill and disabled. My oldest brother confirmed that it's true and is aware of which hospital he's currently in. None of us had any interest in seeing him and we expressed this, though not to her, to our father's sister. His affair partner decided my siblings would never give in, but she knew a much younger me had a hope for a better relationship with my dad and she tried to say she couldn't care for him and their four younger kids that they have under the age of seven, and that my family needs me. I told her clearly that they were not my family, and that she married him so she was responsible for caring for him now that he can't care for himself, and I told her I would not help and I did not care how tough it was for them. Her response was full of anger, but she basically called me a jerk. I ignored her, but she again insulted me and claimed that I was sick and cruel for my stance. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your dad made the choice to be crappy to your family and his affair partner chose to marry him. There's that whole in sickness and in health marriage thing she seems to have forgotten about. Not the jerk. This is karma in action. She's reaping what she sowed. She destroyed your mother and your family. You owe her nothing. There are two jerks in this tale, your father and his affair partner. Am I the jerk for telling my friend that hiring a live-in nanny would make him less of and not a parent? My friend and his wife have been talking about getting pregnant now that they're married. They both work very long hours seven days a week, as they're both workaholics. We're talking 80 plus hours each, and they've been like this for the past seven years that they've been together. When I asked who's going to work less, my friend said they're going to hire a live-in nanny to take care of their kid while they work all day. They make around 200 to 250 k a year together and could easily spend less time working given how much money they have saved. When I asked how much time they expected to spend with their kid, he said he'd probably get around 1 to 2 hours a day and that neither of them liked the idea of changing diapers or waking up at night to take care of the baby, so they'd be happy to pay the nanny to essentially be the 24-7 caregiver. As a father, I was taken aback. Part of being a parent is quite literally taking care of your kids changing diapers, tantrums, being there. I asked how his kid would feel growing up without his or her parents, and he asked what I meant. I told him he's not really a parent if he rarely ever sees his kid and never actually does anything a parent does. Just because your wife gave birth and you happen to be the reason she had a baby doesn't make you parents. It's the act of being a parent that makes you a parent. He got really upset with me and hasn't talked to me much all week, and his wife has been posting passive-aggressively on Facebook since the day I said it but I really don't feel like I'm in the wrong. 
They act like they want to be parents, but would rather pay someone else to do all the work. It just doesn't make sense. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You have a point. A live-in nanny by itself doesn't make you any less of a parent, especially if you really need the extra help. But hearing about how often they work, how they can easily afford to take time off to be with their newborn baby, and how they both just aren't willing to, yeah, you're right. The kid is going to grow up thinking the nanny is their parent and mom and dad are just people they see a little bit before bed. They're not going to have a proper bond. You're the jerk. Plenty of people have live-in nannies and still raise their kids. My parents both worked full-time when I was a kid. They were usually gone like 11 to 12 hours a day. We had an extra basement bedroom, so their childcare solution was live-in babysitters who got a smaller paycheck and room and board, which wound up being cheaper than other options. My parents 100% raised us. We spent a couple hours together on weeknights, but always had dinner together. We spent weekends together. Our family is super close. The babysitters were like fun bonus adults. Don't judge other people's parenting decisions. You make the ones you want. Other people can make the ones they want. Doesn't mean that yours are better. Sounds like this couple loves what they do, which can also be an amazing thing to model for a kid. Am I the jerk for not wanting to take care of my aunt's kids while she's in surgery? I, 17 female, was kind of nudged by my step-uncle, who's in his 50s, to come and take care of his three kids while his wife is in surgery. My family is now angry at me because I said no. Backstory. Both my mom and aunt have had bad blood before I was born, and it has worsened in the past couple of years due to my grandpa passing away. In the late stages of my grandpa's life, aunt never really was around to help or support my mom when their dad was passing. She never made trips to see him, never offered financial support, never got involved in his medical care and medical power of attorney, nothing. Aunt married a very stereotypical neckbeard, overweight, no job, doesn't contribute to house chores, has more steam hours than I do somehow, and really doesn't parent his kids whatsoever. He was a lot more fun to be around when I was a kid because I didn't realize how immature he was. Whenever they come to family functions, Aunt usually tells me, never asks, that I'm now watching her kids while she hangs out with cousins, which I was probably going to do anyways because I do enjoy hanging out with my younger cousins. Recently, she had complications with a very safe, non-life-threatening condition and had to go back to the hospital. This means step-uncle has to watch his kids by himself because she's recovering. My parents are out of town and he keeps sending me videos of all three of them. They're 2, 7, and 11, misbehaving inside the hospital, climbing on furniture, saying stuff like, really need some help right now, or I don't know what to do. I have a pretty mean concussion right now, so I really don't want to leave my house or do anything for that matter. Extended family keeps telling me that I should just go help them because I'm the closest, but I live two hours away and I really haven't ever driven that far before. Am I the jerk for saying no? Edit. I blocked my grandmother who keeps asking me to help and stopped being on my phone up until now. Thanks for all the advice. He kept texting me, so I kept the text open for evidence and screenshots. He started calling me ungrateful and lazy and told me not to talk to him or his kids unless I apologize. Anne came out of surgery and agreed I should have been there. Anyways, I got my school note in and I can play video games now because I'm on the back end of my concussion. The fact that you have a concussion and they're expecting you to drive two hours is absolutely wild and completely unsafe without even mentioning the fact that you've never driven for that long before. You're not the jerk, hon. Good for you for standing up for yourself. Karen's sister stole my bike, so I called the cops on her. I was saving all year for a birthday present for my son, who's turning 14 this year. I was able to get him a bike, and he's been wanting one for a while, since he grew out of his old one about a year ago. His birthday is next Friday, and he's been extremely excited. The bike was kept in my parents' garage, and my sister, who's also 14, decided to take it out for a joyride and managed to get it stolen. I told her she had to find it in 24 hours or I'd be calling the cops. My parents thought I was just trying to scare her, but I really wasn't. I'm a single parent and I saved for months just to get it. My sister couldn't find it, so this afternoon I called the police and they've told me they probably won't be able to get the bike back, but my sister will end up getting a slap on the wrist. My parents are mad at me because I have the potential to ruin my sister's life with this. Am I the jerk? Your parents need to take a loan to buy a bike for your son for his birthday and your sister can get a job to pay them back if need be. Then you'll drop the charges. Until then, she goes through the court process. Not the jerk. You assume that in order to afford the bike, they need to get a loan? Okay, Reddit. Not the jerk. 
Your parents should pay for an exact replacement bike for your son. The sister should earn money for chores and contribute. Not the jerk. Let's get this straight. Your sister was the first person who stole the bike. It was not just a little joyride. This will not have lifelong ramifications on her, getting jobs or into college or renting apartments. It will, however, hold her accountable for her choices and actions. And your parents, like it or not, they should have at the very least offered to pay for a replacement and helped her look for the bike. So a date in family court may be the rude awakening that they all need. Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk for calling the cops on her sister or not? Please let us know. Act like a thief, you'll get treated like one. Next. Am I the jerk for calling my sister's wedding a knockoff of my own? I've always been the favorite among my siblings. As the baby of the family and the only boy, I got doted on a little extra. This extra doting increased when I expressed an interest in dance and actually discovered a talent for it. This makes sense in my mind. My schedule required more time and money devoted to it since I now had to be taken to classes and showcases, needed the proper attire, etc. There were a few years of tension between my sisters and I, especially during our teen years where it seemed like they blamed me for what was going on or expected me to apologize for our parents' choices, something I adamantly refused to do. Tensions seemed to ease some when we went our separate ways. My sisters stuck around in our hometown to get jobs while I moved to a city about an hour away for college. I met my now husband there, and despite what my parents tried to talk us into, we got married in a tiny ceremony at the local courthouse where only immediate family was present. We had a party with our close friends and family later to celebrate, but the ceremony itself was just like we wanted. A small part of an intimate and peaceful day focused on my partner and I. My oldest sister got engaged a couple months ago, and my parents jumped at the chance to start planning an over-the-top wedding. I've been around for some of it, and a lot of what is being offered to the new happy couple is what was suggested to my husband and I when they were trying to convince us to have a big wedding. This didn't bother me at all. In fact, I was happy my sister was getting what seemed like the wedding of her dreams. Unfortunately, it seems she's still holding a grudge over what happened when we were kids and has made multiple jokes about how she's the favorite now and that this is payback for all of the things she missed out on when I was being chauffeured to dance practice. I took the first few in stride, but it's getting old now that it's been repeated so many times. I recently told her the jokes were getting old, but that still didn't stop her. I finally had enough last night, and after a few drinks and a little weekend family get-together, I told her that her wedding was essentially a knockoff of mine, and that I doubted our parents would be putting this much effort in had I gone through with the extravagant plans they wanted me to have a few years ago. She left the room in tears, and I've gotten mixed reactions from family over what I said. Am I the jerk? ETA, I have no interest in special attention from my parents and moved on from the feud with my sisters years ago as I thought that they had as well. I live a good distance from them all with a life of my own and can only make it back to visit a few times a year. This doesn't stem from me craving attention. I'm glad my sister is getting all of it as my parents have a tend to hover even all these years later. My complaint is in the repeated jokes despite my request that they stop. Yes, you're the jerk and it sounds like you've been the jerk their entire lives. You happily soaked up your parents' attention, knowing you were the favorite, and didn't even care that they didn't share your golden child status. Then, the second the attention was off of you, you decide to try to attack as low as you can, instead of being happy that your siblings actually got to experience some of the rarefied air you've been in your entire life. Your siblings taunt you because you are entitled and spoiled, and not very likable as a result. You taunted her because you are mean, and resent not being the center of attention. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. After years of feeling unimportant to your parents, your sister can't control her giddiness at finally having their attention. While her comments are obnoxious, it speaks to a lifetime of being overshadowed by you. While you're not responsible for your parents' crappy behavior, you need to acknowledge it and acknowledge you believe that you deserved it because dance? Give me a break. The biggest problem is that you still see no problem with it. And the minute your sister is getting their attention, you have a problem with it. You're so full of yourself, you have to claim the wedding you didn't have as your own. You're a crappy brother. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his sister? Please let us know. Those jokes she's making would kind of get on my nerves too. I don't know if OP's as bad as they're trying to make him out to be. How my dad didn't go to Vietnam. In 1969, my dad graduated from Rice University with a five-year master's in chemical engineering. Edit. Since so many commenters seem to think he was some kind of rich kid, his parents both taught public school, 
and he went to college on a full academic scholarship. The Vietnam War was raging, and although he and his classmates had all received deferments during their studies, their deferments were over, and it was time for them to go before the draft board. Most of his classmates weren't worried because they were slated to see the Houston draft board, which had a reputation for handing out continued deferments like Halloween candy. However, my dad is from Oklahoma, which meant that he had to be evaluated by the Tulsa draft board, which was much, much stricter. Dad had applied to the chemical engineering PhD program at Stanford and had been accepted with a full stipend. He was excited to go, but first he had to get past the draft board. The Stanford facility wrote a letter to the Tulsa Draft Board explaining that Mr. Hammer would be embarking on a research program that would greatly benefit the war effort and asking for another deferment. The Tulsa Draft Board wrote back in short order, Mr. Hammer had already benefited from the only deferment he was going to get, and thus he was to present himself to the Army Physical Examination Center post haste. Dad was sad to lose his shot at a PhD, but not too sad because now he could marry my mom. He'd also had several job offers already, so he accepted an offer from Exxon and he and my mom got married. His superiors at Exxon wrote another letter to the Tulsa Draft Board explaining that Mr. Hammer was now gainfully employed in the oil and gas industry where he would be conducting engineering research that would greatly benefit the war effort and asking for another deferment. Just as quickly, the Tulsa Draft Board wrote back, reiterating that Mr. Hammer was not going to receive another deferment and that if he didn't hurry up and get his army physical, they might have to get the law involved. Disappointed, my dad went to his army physical as scheduled. He's always been a healthy guy and he performed just fine on most of the examinations up until the very end when they measured his heart rate. It was over 100 beats per minute. Well, we can't pass you with that, said the army doctors, but you're probably just nervous. Come back in two weeks and we'll give you another physical. Nervous, said my dad to himself. I can work with that. For the next two weeks, my dad spent every spare moment basically teaching himself the opposite of meditation. He'd close his eyes and think of the most horrifying mental images he could, trying to drive his heart rate as high as possible. Finally, the day of the physical arrived, and things went much as before. He passed nearly everything with flying colors, but when the time came to measure his heart rate, once again it was well over 100. The army doctors promptly diagnosed him with tachycardia, scored his physical 4F, and sent him home. He's in his 70s now, and apart from his mysteriously high heart rate, which I inherited, he's always been in great cardiac health and still is. So glad your dad didn't have to go over there. Some of us have actual brains and are meant to have an actual impact on the world. I would never serve in the military, and neither would any of my friends. It's honestly just a huge waste of taxpayers' money. I never thank anyone for their service because it's a load of BS. When people ask me, oh, what about all those who paid the ultimate price? I say that choice was theirs, just like my choice to focus on my artwork. One day, I'll be a top animator for my favorite anime because that's what I've set as my goal. I'll be darned if I ever throw away my dreams to join some stupid broken system. Hey Reddit boy, as a vet, how does that last comment make you feel? I'd really rather not talk about it. My daughter-in-law keeps making social media posts that make me look bad. I have a son, Ryan, who's 22. Ryan has a wife, Holly, who's also 22. They got married and moved in together around four months ago after dating for three years. I'm really happy for them. There's just a small problem though. Holly has recently started making posts on social media with jokes about how horrible mother-in-laws are all the time. When seeing them, I thought I did something to upset Holly. I asked her about it and she insisted that I hadn't upset her and that she just posts them because she thinks they're funny. I asked Ryan about it and he said that Holly never seemed upset at me and told me that I'm overthinking it. But Holly keeps making these posts. The rest of my family have even been asking me if everything is okay between me, Ryan and Holly because they've seen the post too. The last straw was when Holly made a post about arguments with monsters in law. Now everyone in my family thinks I argued with Holly when that didn't even happen. I asked Holly about it again and she said that once again she just posted it because she thought it was funny, not anything actually personal to me. I told Holly that she's making me uncomfortable and that she's making my family think I'm being horrible to her. Holly said that's not her problem and that people need to learn how to take a joke. I asked Holly to please stop making these posts because people aren't going to interpret them that way. Holly said I'm being unreasonable and told me I can't tell her what to do and said I'm a bossy jerk. Reported to Facebook for harassment. 
Sometimes you can get posts yanked. You're the jerk. Not everything is about you. Some people like Reader's Digest jokes. Get over yourself. You're the jerk. Well, if you were not having a fight before, now you are. You can't control other people's choice of humor. Sharing a funny meme about mothers-in-law is not an attack on your personal mother-in-law. It is not her job to call up confused relatives and explain jokes that they don't get. You should apologize for overstepping. In the future, don't be so worried about what other people think. Have confidence in yourself and your relationship. And remember that if you are insecure about something, that's your problem, not someone else's. Do you ever get the sense that the people on Reddit just really don't like mothers-in-law? Imagine if OP was the one posting all these memes about how much daughter-in-laws suck. I thought our date went well until I saw what she said about me on TikTok. This is honestly not something I wanted to post about, but here's the thing. I've known this woman, who's 28, for a while since we're in the same friend group. She's a nice person, attractive, and honestly, I've always enjoyed my talks with her. A few weeks ago, I, 26 male, asked her out on a date. I figured if she said no, it's fine, but she actually agreed. We went on a date this past Saturday, and honestly, I thought it was awesome. We went out to dinner, had drinks, spent the rest of the night talking, and we even took a walk on a walking bridge over the town's lake. It's not a big one. I dropped her off and I was elated. I absolutely loved the night. However, that night when I was scrolling through TikTok on my bed, a post from her, I didn't follow nor did I know that she had a TikTok, appeared on my For You page. Essentially, she had said in the post, getting ready for a date I really don't want to go on. That was like a bucket of ice water being thrown on my head. I was so freaking happy and just found out that she didn't even want to go on the date with me. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying she has to want it, but please, let me know if that's the case. We don't need to go out. We can forget I even asked. But doing this on the internet, it made me self-conscious. Not sure if that's even the right word. Now I'm unsure about what to do. Should I tell her I saw this or just forget about it? Honestly, it really hurt me, and I'm not really sure I want to give this another try. I mean, she didn't want to go out with me in the first place, right? Just because she didn't want to go out doesn't mean that she didn't have a good time. I think all of us have been there, where we don't feel like socializing, but it turns out okay or fun. Her not wanting to go may not be a judgment on the OP at all. Could simply be that they weren't in the mood for a date, which might actually be a compliment to OP that she was still wanting to do it for him anyhow. The difference is that most of us didn't post about it on social media, which creates the risk of this exact situation happening. That being said, I definitely agree that OP shouldn't necessarily let this discourage him. I think context matters a lot. Was she saying she didn't want to go out with you or just wasn't in the mood to go out? Is it due to her social anxiety? I rarely want to do the actual things I'm getting ready for. It's 100% anxiety, but that doesn't mean I don't want to spend time with the people I have plans with. Or she just really didn't want to go. I don't know her and I didn't see her video. My only point is that phrase alone doesn't necessarily speak to her feelings about you. I think you might be reading into it too much or need more info. Dating in general sucks. No one wants to do it, especially a first date. There's so many reasons someone may not want to go on a date at any particular time. She may have had a great time despite not wanting to go. You have to see how it goes. Bro, ignore all of these fools making excuses for the wild crap that some people be doing. It's common sense, bro. You don't post TikToks about how you don't want to go on a date with this new guy about to pick you up. That's rude as heck and straight up disrespectful. It's not okay, period. Some of y'all need to get that through your heads. I ain't even surprised that y'all trying to justify this crap. I'm telling you, bro, the dating game is impossible these days and this is why most dudes ain't even trying no more. You may be attractive, but I ain't finna deal with your crazy self posting TikToks about how you don't even want to go on this date that I'm about to take you on. Ignore these fools, bro. They gon' make excuses no matter what the chick does because they dumb as heck. Wow, I hope you know that everything you just said makes you sound like a total idiot. I can barely understand you with your lack of basic grammar. Did you ever attend any sort of schooling whatsoever? I could tear apart literally everything you said, but you wouldn't be worth my time. She can post whatever she wants on TikTok, and if you have a problem with that, that's on you and she deserves better. If you can't get over your own insecurities and ego long enough to realize you're flipping out over a literal TikTok video, you're not a man that's worth giving a chance to in the first place. Goodness, I hope you stay single for the rest of your life. You sound like the kind of person to end up in prison.
Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his date? Please let us know. Move on, bro. Find someone who posts TikToks about how excited they are to be going out on a date with you. My husband has ruined both of our lives by asking me to double up his lunch serving for work. I'm on a throwaway because I still haven't fully decided on divorce, but I'm 95% sure on it. Me, 26 female, and my husband, male 25, we've been married for almost two years now and we have a six-month-old baby. I work part-time only to supplement our income and to pay for the legal process of getting him documented. We are very fortunate that it seems it may be an easy process of maybe two years max for his residency, but now I'm going to cancel everything and ask for a divorce. My routine used to be I wake up one and a half hours before him in the morning and I make him lunch and pack everything for him for work and I have his breakfast coffee and clothes ready for him to wake up, eat and get dressed and head out within 30 minutes. He used to be satisfied with what I packed him of freshly made chicken and either honey buffalo, lemon pepper and salad or some sort of chicken wraps etc. Pure healthy food. I did this because I wanted to make his life easier and show him I cared about him and I love him and I've done this since we first moved in together more than three years ago. Well, recently, I've had to start including dinner leftovers because he started asking for more food and he was still hungry afterwards, which I thought was odd because no matter if I work or not, he always comes home to prepared food, so even if he wasn't full, he would be okay. But I explained it off with maybe he's bulking or something. So I started including what I normally take to work, which has caused me to either go without food and having to wait till after work or be late for work because I have to wait until the food is ready and it takes some time because I'm naturally feeding and I can't miss eating every time. Well, last time when I was packing his lunch, I found an unrecognized second fork in his lunchbox and I was thrown off. So I asked about it and he said that he found it in the kitchen of his work and brought it home. Odd, why didn't he just leave it? I had noticed small changes in him that I gaslighted myself into I'm being insecure about because I had just had a baby but this made the pit of my stomach churn. So a few days later, I decided to go to his work during lunch to surprise him with dessert and for him to see the baby. Well, that was when I found out why he wanted more food. His coworker, he told me, no longer worked there, who I'd caught him talking too friendly to, and I told him it bothered me and I had him remove them from everything and block them on WhatsApp, not only still worked there, but was eating the lunch I freshly prepared for him and he was eating the leftovers. I didn't cause a scene. Instead, I took pictures and added them to my folder of everything he's done before, from simply hearting other girls' stories after telling me he didn't, to all kinds of pictures from his coworkers that he shouldn't have had, which ended up getting him fired. I drove home crying and packed my things when I got home. I took the bassinet and anything else I'd need for my baby and my essentials and I went to my sister and brother-in-laws. I told them everything and even showed them our conversation from WhatsApp where he told me that she no longer worked there. I normally text him through the day, so he started texting me and calling me to see if I was okay and what was for dinner. He was almost off. Is everything okay? And then he got to the house an hour earlier than usual, which also has me questioning if he's been lying about what time he gets off too, and saw mine and the baby's things gone, and my letter that he had seven days to leave my house, and that he can communicate with my mother to see the baby when I'm at work or whenever he wants to see her, just let her know and I'll drop off the baby with her. I, for the time being, don't want anything to do with them and I left the printed photos of them eating lunch together laughing under the letter. Later that night, when I decided I no longer wanted anything to do with him, I informed the lawyer. We had a group WhatsApp chat with me, him, the lawyer, paralegal, and my brother-in-law, our co-sponsor, that I no longer was going to need his services and then messaged the lawyer privately to ask if I could maybe move our contract and the money I paid so far over to his divorce and family practice. He said unfortunately no, there's some clause or something that if we decide to no longer pursue the case, we lose the money we've invested, and also that his immigration practice is a partnership with different people than his family one. But he will just leave our case open till we get a response for our next appointment from the government, and if we haven't worked things out by then, then he will just cancel everything. Well, this caused him to go insane because now if he doesn't get papers, he has to choose between his daughter and parents. To either risk never seeing his parents and family again or never seeing his daughter again if he goes over there. He's begging me to the point I blocked him on everything. He's came to my brother-in-law's house and been told to leave or were calling the police. Then he later came back drunk with his buddies who then were all scared off by my brother-in-law and his shotgun. I feel so lost, broken and depressed. 
I also have security at work to make sure he doesn't show up at my office. My sister tells me to leave him, but not to divorce him so he can never get with anyone else and get papers, but I can't do that to him. I've gone back home, only to check on the house and see if he's gone. I'm still staying with my sister. And surprisingly, there's no damage to anything, and his things only are gone. So at least I feel a little relief in that. I'm not looking for advice. I know I'm not going back. There's no longer any trust. My mental health wouldn't be safe in that relationship, and I know I can't have my daughter grow up with that kind of relationship being an example. I just needed to put this out there in order for it to solidify in my brain and to be able to reflect that this is now a pattern and he's gone beyond disrespecting me by now also making me make her food. I've been budgeting trying to make things last, sometimes eating less than I want or skipping meals if possible. If a meal was heavier on carbs, I'd skip since I should have enough for my milk supply. All to be able to pay bills, lawyer, his gym membership and supplements. I lose out on rest and sleep because I ensure laundry in the house is kept spotless while the baby sleeps. I've basically gone from an independent, educated career woman to a 50s housewife with a job in school. All because I blindly fell for this man. When I say I feel stupid, that's an understatement. Things I want to clarify. No, my sister isn't pushing me to stay in the relationship with him. She's telling me not to divorce him so that he can't just go find another woman to marry and use for the green card. No, I'm not taking anything from him that wasn't mine before we got married. Before me, he lived in a house with seven other men sharing a bedroom with a bunk bed, and he drove a 2000 Buick he had to unplug from the battery in order to use it again. That car got scraped after the electrical went out. The car he's using is my car I got in high school that got me through high school part-time, seasonal jobs, and community college. Also, my mom is still alive. She gave me my childhood home because I wasn't going to college and it's 10 minute commute from the college. She gave it to me because I'm the last of her kids. All my brothers and sisters are at least 10 years older and aside from my sister who's helping me, they all live in different states. He left home with a motorcycle of his customizing, his gaming systems, clothes, and the guest bedroom TV, which was the only TV that was not mounted. Also, I'm not keeping his daughter from him. I just personally don't want to see him because I know he'll try to give me a ton of excuses and try to make me understand him. He can speak to my sister or mom and they'll supervise him to see his daughter whenever he wants to. There is no battle in that. I don't think he's a bad father, but I just don't think my relationship with him is the example I want to give my daughter. Yes, I'm Mexican too. My dad came to the States and then later brought my mom and two brothers and two sisters took a decade to see each other again, which is why I'm so apart from my siblings and the only one born here. Just adding that I was told if you get a divorce before everything is finalized, he can't get citizenship anyway in the US. I left my ex-husband when I found out it was only for the green card. Do not let anyone blame you for the green card issues he's going to face now. He made the decision to cheat on you, despite knowing that your marriage was what was getting him his green card in the first place. He made this mess, not you. Now he's the one who has to clean it up. Am I the jerk for asking the lady sitting next to me at a concert to stop knitting? I went to a concert tonight at a seated venue to see a folk singer. The music is relatively tame and quiet and fairly emotional. In my opinion, seeing this artist is a pretty immersive music experience, at least for me. I was really excited to see this particular show at a seated theater where it's easier to just focus on the music. I'd venture a guess that most of the people who would go to this type of show are going because they're emotionally invested in this person's music. The show starts and I notice the woman sitting directly next to me is knitting. Odd, I thought, but okay. But as the show went on, I kept finding myself so distracted by this knitting. I must have tried for a solid 30 minutes to ignore it, but the constant motion in my peripheral vision plus the quiet clicking of the needles kept stealing my attention away from the show. After a while, I felt like I couldn't focus on the show anymore, and all I could think about was whether I should try to politely say something. The woman was with a partner, and I noticed on their other side there were two to three open seats. So I finally worked up the courage to politely say something. I thought the best and least disruptive way was to write a note on my phone and show it to her, so that's what I did. The note said, this is a direct copy-paste. I'm so sorry to ask, and I know this is probably ridiculous, but the knitting is distracting me from enjoying the show. Would you mind either stopping or moving one seat over? Again, I'm sorry. I don't know. I assumed anyone who knitted in public, and especially someone at this kind of a very chill show, was probably a generally chill human being, so I was not expecting the kind of negative reaction that followed. The woman gave me the nastiest look, 
let out an angry sigh, threw her hands up, dramatically stuffed her knitting stuff into her bag, huffed and puffed to her partner, and then got up and completely left the show. I was so baffled by how angry she got, especially since I tried really hard to phrase this as politely as I could. I even considered that maybe there are reasons beyond my understanding why someone might not be able to sit still during a show and might need to keep their hands busy. Neurodivergence, some sort of recovery, some other reason. So I really tried to avoid speaking up out of sensitivity. And again, it's why I included the suggestion that maybe she could just slide over instead of stopping completely. I realized that knitting is definitely not the most disruptive thing a person can do. And I couldn't tell if me asking her to stop was unreasonable and maybe I should have just sucked it up. But I thought I was polite about it, and I'm still just really shocked at how mad she got, and even more shocked that she completely left the show halfway through the set. So, am I the jerk for asking her to stop knitting or move over one seat? Edit. I think the use of the word concert is misleading people here, and people might think concert is a loud environment. This was a fairly quiet folk show at a theater, as opposed to a rock or a pop concert at an arena. The room was dead silent outside of the performance itself. The set included some full band songs, some solo acoustic, some that were just vocals and fiddle and guitar. The needles did make a clicking sound, probably equivalent to someone typing on their phone with long nails. OP is absolutely not the jerk. Anyone saying otherwise has never been to this type of show before. You can hear a pin drop as the audiences are generally very quiet, similar to a classical concert. The clickety clack of knitting needles would certainly be audible and would certainly be distracting if you were set close. Plus, as someone who has played dozens of shows like this, seeing someone in the audience just knitting away would be demoralizing as a performer and would feel pretty disrespectful. I don't knit, so I would assume it had their full attention and they weren't particularly interested in my music. Not the jerk. Anyone who'd walk out on a music performance if she can't knit her way through it is on her own. You were entirely within bounds, making a reasonable request to remove a distracting activity. Not customary at this sort of public gathering out of your peripheral view and earshot. Your suggestion was polite and considerate. The lady was the problem, not you. Am I the jerk for telling brother-in-law that if he wants to charge us for a family trip, he should pay us back for every cent we gave him? My husband and I are quite well off and child-free by choice. Neither of us were born into a particularly wealthy family, but we both prioritize learning to manage our finances and have invested a lot of effort into our careers. My husband's brother, I'll call him Sam, ended up in a tight situation five years ago. He had a drinking problem to begin with, and then his girlfriend accidentally got pregnant and they had twins to deal with, and they were barely managing to afford the rent in a one-bedroom with a roommate, plus student loan debt. My husband wanted to help his brother because his parents couldn't really afford to, and I was okay with it because we did have money to spare and I really did feel bad for them. We supported them for almost a year. They lived with us, and once Sam recovered from his problems and they moved out, we still gave them significant financial help. Over the last few years, they've been doing better and better. They paid off most of their debt and they own a small home. A few weeks ago, they invited us on a vacation with them. I was happy to see the twins after so long and my husband was happy to spend some time with his brother. It was a week long stay at a nice resort and I was surprised and pleased that they had gone from no cash at all to being able to afford a holiday for six people. Two days after we got home, Sam sent me a message saying that we should pay $1,500 for our share of the trip. I was shocked because they didn't say anything about us paying when they invited us. It also seemed strange that they had split the cost, including both of our airlines, when my husband and I lived much closer to the destination and had much lower airfare costs than Sam's family did. I wrote back saying that we would not be paying because we thought they were inviting us as family and not as paying guests. I said they should have mentioned us paying our share before the trip if they wanted to. He wrote back quite angrily and said family is all very well, but family doesn't mean you can take advantage of someone's kindness. This rubbed me the wrong way, so I went through some of our old financial records and sent him an estimate of how much we had spent on his family over the years. I said, if you don't want to take advantage of anyone's kindness, then please start paying us back for all of this and we'll pay for the vacation. He didn't respond, but apparently called and yelled at my husband over the whole thing. My husband thinks I was needlessly petty and that it was cruel of me to rub it in his face, but that they needed help from us a long time ago. He says we should just pay and forget about it because it's selfish of me to expect them to feel like they owe us for something we did on our own free will. And it's true that I would be less annoyed about them asking us to pay if not for how much we helped them in the past. 
Am I the jerk for holding this over their head? Not the jerk. If he wanted y'all to go Dutch, he could have said so up front. He didn't. Also, he wants you to split his airfare costs? Oh no. He sees you and your husband as a piggy bank if he couldn't handle the scorekeeping, which is what he did when asking for reimbursement after the fact. Also, five years isn't a long time. That's still pretty fresh. Moral of the story for him, don't invite people to a vacation you can't afford. If he wanted to split the cost, he should have communicated that up front. Am I the jerk for asking that my boyfriend pay for a replacement cheesecake? So I, 20 female, have been dating Jacob, 26 male, for about two years. We met through my older brother at a New Year's Eve party. We've lived together for the last six months and everything has been great, except for his habit of eating my snacks, particularly the sweets that I buy. I mainly didn't mind it because I don't have a huge sweet tooth like he does and I don't buy them all the time, so him snagging a few cookies wasn't a big deal. It occasionally did annoy me because he would sometimes get to it before me, but he apologized for it. However, my favorite dessert is cheesecake and I get a particular one from an expensive bakery that I don't get very often due to how pricey it is. So when I got to buy it Saturday, I was excited and I popped it in the fridge for me to eat after work and dinner. I figured Jacob wouldn't eat it because he knows how much I like it, or if he wanted a slice, he'd wait for me to get home and ask me about it. Boy, was I wrong. When I got home from a job and ate my ready-made meal, I looked in the fridge for the cheesecake, only to find more than half of it was gone. It was astonishing how much he ate, and I was upset because I had been waiting all day to eat it. Jacob was in our bedroom playing video games, and I walked in with the cheesecake box, asking why he ate more than half of the cheesecake without telling me. It honestly looked like he ate it with his hands, which disgusted me. Jacob stuttered that he didn't think I would mind since I don't eat sweets a lot anyways, and I usually share with him anyways. I pointed out that the cheesecake is one of my favorite, and I technically don't share. He just takes my snacks without asking. This developed into an argument back and forth, which I eventually asked that he pay for a replacement. Jacob refused, saying it was too expensive and I was taking things too far. I persisted, telling him it's not that much of a big deal to replace and I would give him money to do it. Jacob eventually left for his mom's place because I was unreasonable and demanding and that he had talked to me in the morning. Well, it's the next day and it's been radio silence from Jacob. I asked my friends and some agreed that he should pay for a replacement, but others said that it was just cake and I shouldn't demand for him to pay for something I didn't really need. Not the jerk, but I don't think the issue is the cost of the cheesecake but rather how you two share space and food. Basically, he's not listening to you and not thinking of you, then getting defensive when confronted and then running to his mama to throw a temper tantrum for days, which frankly, he's way too old to do. It would just gross me out if my partner sat down and ate over half a cheesecake all at once. That's like at least 3,000 calories, maybe even 5,000 depending on toppings and size, etc. Plus like two weeks worth of a healthy daily sugar requirement. Seems like he should feel like total crap after consuming all of that. Sweet addiction is a real thing, so is binge eating. I wonder if part of his defensiveness and immaturity around the issue is that he's suffering from some sort of eating disorder. Yeah, asking for him to replace the cost is fair. He should do that just because cheesecake is expensive, but I don't think it will solve the problem you two are having. Not the jerk. It's not really about the cake, it's about how he's treating you. He takes things that you haven't given to him and expects you to be okay with it probably a good time for an adjustment in this relationship. Not the jerk. I don't want to use extreme words, but he sounds unstable, or at least immature. Refusing to pay for something he ate? Refusing to go pick up the food with your money? Coupled with how he's dating someone who's six years younger than him? This is all just gross. My Karen daughter refuses to pay rent. I, 50 female, told my daughter, who's 24, she needs to pay rent. She got out of college in February and has struggled to find a job until October. I supported her during the job hunt and she's been living home rent free. I was excited for her to finally find a job, especially when it's surprisingly well paying. She told me she won't get paid until late this month. I said it was fine, but she still needs to pay rent. The other day she told me she planned a trip with her friends and was saving for plane tickets. I reminded her again, she still needs to pay me rent as it felt like she's trying to avoid rent so she could save money for her trip. She told me she would pay the rent by deducting her credit card bill. Apparently, she wanted me to pay her credit card bill first, then keep the rest as rent. I told her that was unacceptable. She rolled her eyes and tried to walk away. In the heat of the moment, I said some unfortunate things. 
At the end of the fight, she finally agreed to pay the rent and her own credit card bill. My daughter has become extremely distant since. She started working overtime almost all week. I tried to talk to her. I even told her that she can keep her original plan, but she just kept fixating on the things that I've said, either ignoring my message or telling me how I've misunderstood her and I made her feel bad. My husband thinks I'm the jerk because he thinks our daughter was already stressed and I kept reminding her for the rent money she didn't have. Demanding rent in a fight made me the villain. Today, she handed me a stack of cash, rent and credit card bill included. I tried to tell her the money will be in a family savings account. She rolled her eyes and said she doesn't care. She then cut up the credit card I was managing the bills for. My husband gave me a, I told you so, look. I honestly don't think that I deserved any of this treatment. I love my daughter very much, but I can't help but wonder if my husband was right. Am I the jerk? Info. A lot of people have asked me what I said, so I'll answer here. The reason why I said it doesn't matter is because not only did she confront me on the spot, I don't think she'd react that way if the fight hadn't been about money. It was in the heat of the moment. I may have called her a bad or a crappy person, but that was it. I did not cross the line. I'll clarify the Christmas present part. We charged it on installment so she knew how much it cost. She's still entitled to use the credit card as she likes. She paid as much as she could with her part-time jobs. Like I mentioned in one of the replies, she never made that much. She barely paid any part of that iPad. It's mostly on her own food and chores. My husband and I covered the rest. They aren't dead. Nothing can't be paid off with her income. More info. If she doesn't want to pay the rent, she doesn't have to. We want her to contribute to the family. Based on how much she's making, the amount equal to the broader city average rent is what me and my husband decided on. She can afford it. She isn't struggling. Final update. This will be my last update on the Christmas gift situation. So many people seem to be fixated on it. No, we didn't make her pay for it. We charged it on her card so she knew how installments worked. This was just a rare incident. We have a large sum expense. My husband and I paid it off at the end of each month. She made little money tutoring back in college and she used the credit card for food and clothes. These were the expenses she actually paid for and what she made were oftentimes not enough and I had to cover the extra. The average rent is for a studio apartment in the broader city. As I've mentioned, it's impossible to find a decent rental in this area. There is no comp for it. I'm tired and this will be my final update. You're the jerk. In the heat of the moment, you said some unfortunate things. This is my favorite am I the jerk behavior. We have no idea what you said here, but since you're trying to hide it, I bet it made you sound like a colossal jerk. So, you're the jerk. Now you're mad that your daughter doesn't want to treat you like family when you treat her like a tenant. You want to act like a crappy landlord, you're going to get treated like a crappy landlord. Right? And in a comment, she says what she said didn't matter. No, it matters. And her not wanting to reveal what she said makes me think she said some unforgivable stuff. OP sounds like my mother-in-law. Just say the most hurtful crap you can think of to win the argument. Try to pretend like it never happened, then wonder why people are still mad about it years later. She poisoned her relationship with my brother-in-law that way, and she's chipping away at my husband too. OP, when your daughter stops talking to you, this will be why. Info. What unfortunate things did you say? That seems to be pretty central information you've left out. In response to the edit, calling your kid a crappy person is crossing the line. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. First, for whatever you said to her that you're not telling us. Second, for knowingly demanding rent from your daughter, starting from before she actually gets paid. She's your kid. Would it hurt to wait two months and have a plan for reasonable rent starting then? Getting a new job involves expenses, professional clothes, figuring out transportation, etc. You're not a landlord, you're a parent. If you want her to treat you like a landlord, you'll need to give her the autonomy of a tenant. Her room and designated spaces are her own. You can't touch food that she buys or prepares. You can't ask about her finances at all, beyond expecting a rent check on time. You're in the right to act this way, but coming from a supposed loving parent, you're the jerk. Your daughter is right to cut up the credit card you have access to if you're going to act this way towards her. You can't have it both ways, with the control of a parent and the income of a landlord. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for how they acted or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for wanting to cash out my life insurance policy? So yeah, I have a terminal medical condition. I'm male 28, which I won't go into too much detail about. 
I didn't have the best health insurance and doctors, so I found out I had a big problem pretty much when it was too late. About the only thing I had of value, other than some meager savings, an even smaller 401 and my car, was a life insurance policy I got years ago when I was 18. It was a relatively small amount yearly and awesome terms, so why not? I always thought I could swap it over to a future wife and kids, but not happening now. So I haven't been able to work now for about two months, but I won't be eligible for hospice care until probably a few weeks before the end. The actual policy itself was for an eye-watering amount if I'd passed before a certain age, which unfortunately is what's going to happen. I've been living at home with my parents rent-free since I stopped working, which is good of them. We haven't had the best relationship growing up, and they pretty much only did the minimum required by law in terms of how they raised me. No complaints, but not parents of the year material. A lot of this was due to finances. I've been putting money towards food and utilities, but not the rent they are paying, as that was a cost they were covering by themselves, and my being here hasn't increased it. Anyway, I've been investigating cash outs, both through the company and investor groups that will give you a bit more in exchange for being named as beneficiary. I will probably stick with the company offer to get things moving faster. There are going to be some taxation issues, but the end result will be that my parents will essentially get an amount that will cover my funeral and possibly a really good secondhand car. I estimate that the amount I will get will be enough for me to rent a nice condo near the beach, nice meals, maid service, some great experiences while I'm well enough, and some in-home care nursing towards the end. My parents have basically said that the life insurance policy named to them will set them up for life and allow them to buy a house and invest, etc., and probably even retire early. They're in their 50s, and we're probably going to have to work until they dropped. They're telling me that they've made a lot of sacrifices to have me move into their house until I go to hospice, but I really don't see what that is other than the inconvenience of three adults in a two-bedroom house. One of them was going to give up work towards the end to provide some home care until I qualified for hospice, but my cashing out will mean they can keep working. I get that it would be the noble thing to help my parents out, but I don't want to. Final edit. I'm tired and I'm going to have a nap. Thanks to all the messages of support and clarification on hospice entitlements and Finn advice. To put concerns to rest, when I said I won't be eligible for hospice for a few weeks before the end, I worded it badly. As much as is in my power, the only time I will go into hospice proper is my last few weeks. I'm young and strong and I plan to spend as much time by the sea until I can't. Let's see if life messes that up for me too. I will be meeting up with my social worker soon and making sure I claim everything I can. I love my parents, despite the past, and my family and I know this is putting a terrible strain on all of us, and I hope they will forgive me and keep the best memories on top. That's all everyone, take care. Edit. A few people have asked about the cash out versus beneficiary payment. Six figures cash out, seven figures if it goes to the beneficiaries. It's a crazy good policy, but only because of my age and the condition I have. It's like winning the worst lottery ever. Not the jerk. Your parents are looking at you as a post-mortem ATM. They actually are looking forward to you passing so they can cash in. Take the money and spend it how you wish. If you don't have long to go, you should be spending it as happy and comfortable as you're able to. Besides, it's your life insurance. It's your money. It's a kindness already to leave enough to cover the funeral. Your loss shouldn't be their gain. They should want the best for you while you're here. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Cash it out. Rent your condo and enjoy the time you have left. Who cares if they get mad about it? They're only looking at what you can do for them and don't care how much happier you will be for the remainder of your life. They're being selfish instead of being caring parents. You enjoy that money. You deserve it more than they do. You're gonna need to repeat that back to me. Double malicious compliance. Hey y'all, it's drive through OP again. I'll start off by saying this. If you ever feel petty enough to ruin a drive through person's day at work, ask them to repeat the order back. This isn't because it takes too long or it's difficult so much as it's insulting to our intelligence. I still do it with a smile, mostly, but not this evening. When a car drives in the drive through it sets the sensor off instantly and we hear everything everyone in the car says. My headset beeps, I greet the customer, and I hear, oh sweet, mellow yellow peach. I ask whether he wants a small, medium, or large. No jerk, not you. How about you pay attention? Enter malicious compliance one. I'll pay attention, all right. In the meantime, I tell him to let me know when he's ready. He orders in the most convoluted way possible, 
insulting me directly in between every other item. I even do him the favor of making his items a combo, because I've learned that when in doubt, err towards nice. He then stops me as I'm about to say the total. Look dude, you're gonna need to repeat that back to me. I know you messed that crap up. He had a very rude tone the whole way, which I'm learning to be better at picking up on in my twilight years. I'm 46. Enter Malicious Compliance Part 2, which unlocks Part 1. Time to employ my memory and voice acting skills. You got it, sir. In my California surfer Keanu Reeves voice. Dude, sweet, mellow yellow peach. I then go back to my voice for my parts. Small, medium, or large? No, jerk, not you. Well, let me know when you're ready. Okay, man, I want a bacon burger, a big one. Which burger, sir? We have... Look, dummy, a bacon burger. I keep going back and forth, switching between exaggerated and insulting California dude crush voice and my regular voice. Each of the five times he called me a name in the transcript, I make it in my voice, so it's me insulting him with his own words. My manager, Bruce, jumped behind the ice machine to laugh at what I was saying. I repeated like 98% of the conversation verbatim, right up to the request to repeat it back to me. He finally says, you know what? Goodbye, and go forget yourself. I say, have a nice evening, and wave to a man who was in the process of ruining his tire just to make a gesture with the hand towards me as he unsuccessfully passes the drive through window. I couldn't have planned it any better. He seriously popped his tire as he hopped the right curb. The best part? The two family nuggets he ordered, 50 nuggets for $11.99, didn't have to be made. Bruce was happier than any of us about this, as the cost to the company was so great. This guy disappeared into a flurry of yellow lights, clanking chains, and customers with carfuls of food, hopefully never to be heard from again. My wife refuses to pay her fair share around the house. I, male 39, have been married to my wife Stacy, female 30, for five years now, and we have two kids together. I also share three kids with my ex-wife Hannah, female 37. Ever since Stacy and I got together, She's made it very clear to me that my three kids are mine and Hannah's responsibility, not hers. This has worked out well so far, but lately it's been taking a toll on me. I pay Hannah child support every month. Ever since Stacy had our first kid, she's demanded that I give her the same amount of money each month to keep things fair. In addition, I have to pay for half of our joint household expenses, like the mortgage, utilities, food, and my own car. Stacy pays for the majority of expenses for our kids. Here lies the problem. Stacy has never taken issue with having to care for mine and Hannah's kids. She picks them up from school, takes them to activities, and ensures they have everything they need. However, anytime she purchases anything for them, she immediately sends me a Venmo request and demands I cover all expenses related to the kids that are not hers. We recently went on a family vacation and she demanded that I pay for half of the portion for our kids and all of the portion for Hannah's. I told her that all these expenses are taking a hit on my finances and she didn't even seem to care. She reiterated that my kids are my responsibility. To add insult to injury, she recently started contributing money to college funds for her kids while Hannah and I have nothing saved for our kids' college. Hannah found out and asked that I start funds for our kids. When I talked with Stacy about this, she said this was fine, but I had to put the same amount of money in the funds she has set up for the kids. I told Stacy I need her to start paying her fair share of expenses around the household. I cannot afford to pay child support, household expenses, and all of these miscellaneous expenses that come up for my kids. It wouldn't hurt her financially, as she makes more than me and could easily spare some money. Stacy blew up and took our kids to her parents' house, and I haven't heard from her in a day and a half. Am I the jerk for demanding that she pay her fair share? You're the jerk. Stacy is paying half of the household expenses. Stacy is paying for majority of things for the two kids you have with her. Stacy is helping you with childcare for three kids that are not her own. Stacy does not have to contribute to their college funds. That is on you and Hannah to figure out. It's not her fault that neither Hannah or you thought about this until she was proactive about her kids' future. We recently went on a family vacation and she demanded that I pay for half of the portion for our kids and all of the portion for Hannah's. How is this unreasonable? The only thing that is a little odd is that you're giving Stacy the same monthly amount that you give your ex. This is confusing to me. I suppose it makes me question where this money goes, how much money she lost in earnings when she was pregnant with the two kids, 
who paid the medical expenses, etc. Karen, my wife's friend, tried to cheat with me while my wife was out of town. Should I tell her what happened? My wife and I have been married for 11 years. We've been happy and my wife is awesome. She's been friends with Beth for at least 8 years. They also work together. Beth and I have always been on friendly terms, hovering on friends. Never any awkwardness. She's been a regular in our lives for a long time. Recently, my wife was out of town for a few days. I was out for groceries and I found Beth in one of the aisles. We ended up chatting and shopping together for about 20 minutes, just banter. We were about to go our separate ways in the parking lot. She asked me what I was doing later and I said messing around in the garage. If you want any company, I can drop my groceries off and swing by. I said something like, nah, I'm fine, just me and the dogs, not really thinking about it. I pause, then she said, oh yeah, forgot she's out of town, I'll see you around then. Beth sent me a couple of texts later that night about a show that she thought I would like. I said, I'll check it out, thanks. About 10 minutes later, she sent, what are you doing up? I didn't respond, it was feeling off. We have never texted each other unless there was a reason. I doubt she forgot my wife was out of town because A, they're close friends, B, they work together, and my wife hadn't been to work in two days, and C, if you want any company. So I'm assuming she knew I would be alone. We've never hung out without my wife, but we're going to now that she's several states away? Was it an innocent gesture that she stepped back from when she realized it might be crossing a line? Fast forward to a barbecue at my house about a week ago. She mostly stuck with my wife and sister-in-law all evening. Anytime I was around, she went quiet and she barely acknowledged me. She left towards the end of the night and walked by me without saying a word. I'm conflicted on whether I should bring this up to my wife or not. If one of my friends had the same interaction with my wife while I were out of town, I'd want to know about it. On the other hand, what if I'm wrong and I cause a falling out that doesn't need to happen? My main argument for the latter is this. I knew Beth's ex-husband back in the day and her two serious partners in the year since then. She has a distinctive type of guy that she always goes for and it definitely doesn't fit my profile. Part of me wants to push it to the side and let it blow over. Keep your mouth shut. No way this doesn't blow up if you bring it up. If wife brings it up, say you didn't think it was important. How much do you love drama? She took her shot, it missed, now she's embarrassed. Personally, I'd leave it alone unless she keeps after you. No harm, no foul. Let it lie. I don't see any lines crossed. She asked to hang out, you said no, that was it. It's a stretch to then interpret her later not being social as a sign that her asking to hang out was an attempt to hook up with you. It would be different if she was flirting or giving you compliments or otherwise demonstrating some interest in you, but as it stands, I see nothing wrong. I'd pretend it never happened myself. If you bring this up to your wife, no question their friendship is over. Even if Beth was fishing, which is debatable since everything you mentioned is circumstantial, you didn't take the bait, so this is a nothing burger. You have no idea what's going on in her life right now. This could have just been a moment of weakness for her, and if it was, it would really suck for her to lose a good friend because of something else that was going on in her life and she had a momentary lapse of judgment. I agree. OP needs to let this die and let the woman move on from what could have been someone who was desperate for a friend or socialization. OP did the right thing by not following through on any of her requests and honestly, this was a great example of how these situations should be handled. Tell your wife, brother. You as a man would definitely want to know if a friend of yours was trying to hang out with your wife while you were out of town or texting her late at night asking why she was still up. So give your wife that same level of respect and tell her about what her friend tried to do and she can make the call. I'm always amazed at how unintelligent most of these commenters are telling you to act like this never happened. No wonder there are so many new stories on here every day about relationships gone wrong. These people have no clue how to actually act in a relationship. And just for kicks, imagine if the roles were reversed and the husband's friend was the one trying to cheat with the wife while he was out of town. You Redditors would be singing a very different song. Well, what would you do if you were OP? Would you tell your wife about her friend or not? Please let us know. I know last commenter got massively downvoted, but I loved that part he said about no wonder there's so many relationship stories on Reddit. Do these people even have brains? NPCs don't have brains, Karen. Am I the jerk for not telling anyone that I became a millionaire this year? I'm 33, male. I've been self-employed for 10 years this year. I also started an LLC about 7 years ago. So far this year, I've made more money than the last 10 years combined. 
I grew up very poor and my mom passed away when I was just 10. After my mom passed, I was raised by my grandmother. I told her about two years ago that I would be a millionaire before she leaves this earth and she said not to tell anyone if I did. I haven't made any major purchases since I recently became a millionaire, but I'm always nice to people close to me and 90% of the time I'll pick up the tab if I go out with friends or family. So my question is this, am I the jerk for not telling anyone, including my wife, about it so far? Update. First, let me address those saying this is a humble brag or something of that sort. I know myself well and I'm the last person to ever want to seek validation, especially on the internet. I made this post out of curiosity to see if it's worth sharing this information and to hopefully inspire others who might have dreams of starting or currently running a small business. Again, I would like to humbly state that this post is not to brag, but definitely to inspire. I'm surprised my post got so many questions, almost 2,000 comments. I'll answer some of the most frequent questions since it would take so much of my time to answer them individually. Why haven't you told your wife? For the women in the comments section saying I'm the jerk for not telling her yet, these comments made me appreciate my wife even more because she didn't marry me for money. I noticed most of these comments are geared towards a transactional marriage. I didn't say I was opposed to letting her know, I said I haven't told anyone as of yet. I've made six figures per year most years for the past few years, so it's not like I'm hiding that. Last year we made around 270 k and she was super excited about that until she found out how much we owed in taxes. That was only because we didn't prepay enough money and we have enough taxes from our W-2 income since our tax bracket got significantly higher than the previous year. So it's not like she doesn't know about me earning six figures. She's just as humble as I am and she doesn't ask for a lot. Her birthday's coming up and she only asked me for a bag that's less than $200, even knowing that I made all that money before. So yeah, I said that to show how humble she is. With so many people saying she would be upset if I didn't tell her right away. I asked her this today. Would you feel any type of way if I were to become a millionaire and I didn't tell you right away? And would she tell anyone? Her answer was, absolutely not, but she would be happy for me and for us because I work so hard. Question, what type of business do you have? Started off by doing business in my name first. A couple of years after it got super profitable, I formed my LLC. It was never always a lot of money. My business kind of fluctuates. In 2013, I made $4,000. 2014, I made $76,000. And after that, it was like a roller coaster. I first started off by making YouTube videos. Six years later, after my income slowed down, I transitioned to e-commerce and tried to drop ship via various platforms, but it didn't work for me until I tried selling on Amazon. A few years after that, I got into music production and I started to ghost produce and release music that got a lot of streams. Please note, I have nothing to sell you here. I'm just sharing my story and I hope that I'll be able to inspire and motivate anyone who needs to hear this. I must also note that everything I'm doing now, I've learned it for free on YouTube. Remember, people will always try to sell you stuff when you watch their video. Be smart and try to be curious and figure stuff out on your own. Everything I've listed here is a passion of mine that I was always curious about. I never got bored when trying them out. Question. 1 million is like 100,000 back in the late 90s. Do you have 1 million? So far this year, I'm estimated to make 1.9 to 2.1 million by the end of the year. Question. Do you spend a lot of money? I don't spend a lot, but we go on vacation once or twice a year. On average, I'd say I spend about 5% of my income monthly. My car's paid off, and my wife's car is paid off as well. Your grandmother was a smart woman. Keep on being cheap, totally, but do tell your wife. You need to consider what being cheap means. You need to be willing to spend money on quality items that will make your life better. Nothing wrong with quality shoes, reliable, safe, comfortable vehicles, and presentable clothes. You need comfortable furniture that won't fall apart. You need a place to live that's not miserably cheap. Please don't keep your wife in the dark. She needs to go with you to an attorney to do estate planning. The two of you need to make a budget and spending plan together. Don't be my ex who could have been a millionaire but never met a dollar that he couldn't spend away. I was with you until you said your wife doesn't know. I have trust issues and I like privacy but I don't want to ever get married because, amongst other things, I know I would be wrong to treat a spouse like that. OP. She doesn't know yet, but I was thinking about surprising her when tax time comes. We file taxes jointly most of the time since we get a lot of tax breaks, so she'll eventually know. She'll get more excited if I don't tell her before she sees it. Tell your wife. Keeping this from her could end your marriage and your status as a millionaire if she leaves you. She's making decisions based on what she thinks your financial situation is, while you're canceling the real situation from her. That's a betrayal. 
I sure hope you had a prenup in place. Poor people will always be jealous of those of us who have money, but statistics show that once your net worth is over one million, your wife is eight times more likely to divorce you. That's what happened to me, both of my brothers, and several friends who had high net worths. The marriage sort of switches from, we're a team and depend on each other, to more of a, this guy is loaded and if I leave, I get half of it. Edit. I knew I'd get massively downvoted for stating the obvious. Maybe try reading some finance management books instead of watching animes. Have fun making my Big Macs, you dumb kids. Well, what would you do if you became a millionaire? Would you tell people or keep it secret? Please let us know. Rule number one of having lots of money. Never tell people you have lots of money. Especially your spouse. Unless you want to deal with the in-laws demanding money from you. Well, you know what they say, Karen. That money that you work so hard for belongs to you and your spouse. I know that's what they say, I just don't like it. My fiancé wants me to get rid of my backup plan for in case our marriage fails. Plus final updates. I've always had a backup plan. My backup plan includes a place to live, money for general expenses, and a rainy day fund. It's more complicated than that, but this is the gist of it. I like having it when I've explained to previous partners that I have one and I let them decide if they're okay with it. My fiancé knew this before he started dating me exclusively. He knew that if we ever got married, I would require a prenuptial agreement and a request that this backup plan stays intact. A couple of days ago, he told me he wasn't okay with this plan any longer. I don't think that's fair. He comes from a wealthy family and the prenuptial agreement protects him and I should have something that protects me. I'm actually finding myself really angry about this because I was an open book about this every step of the way and now I feel like he's changed his mind. He says that having this plan makes it seem like I will leave him while I think it protects me. I'm annoyed because it's not fair to me to change your mind when you knew my expectations from the very beginning. Edit. I put this post up because I was annoyed that he essentially told me this on Friday, minutes before our meeting with the lawyers. I was and am annoyed, but he follows my Reddit account, so throw away. I don't tell every person about this plan, only ones that I've gotten serious with, which is a grand total of two. The backup plan is complicated, but it doesn't do him over in any way. It protects me and I would be paying for the property and still contributing the same amount that he would be to our household expenses and savings. Now that he knows what the plan entails in depth, he wants to just not sign anything on both sides. This is a bad idea. I would be unprotected, but so would he, and he has way more than I do. He feels like I have one foot out the door. I don't. I love him, but my dad is a divorce lawyer, and from what I've heard and seen, better to protect yourself and not need it than no protection and then have to pick up the pieces. Both of our parents agree that a prenuptial is needed. I'm not getting rid of this plan. There's not anything that would make me compromise about this. I told him he has a decision to make because I'm not changing my mind. Yes, I told him about this post as more people have seen it. Rather, he finds out about it from me than someone else or just being on Reddit. Update. I understand his perspective now and he understands mine. It never crossed our minds to break up and I think we both needed some time to think. I understand this is Reddit, but please don't bash my partner. I understand I was vague, but to call him names and try to tear down his character when you don't know him is not okay. I also don't know why I'm clarifying things. It's honestly a little therapeutic. To clarify some things about my backup plan, I called it that because I started it at 25. I have had it for about 10 years now. I'm in my mid-30s. It's an emergency savings account, another savings account, and a property I own. I use my main job to pay for my household expenses with my fiancé and also to fill my main savings. I have a trust, but also investments as well, but my dad helps me handle those. The emergency savings is only money from additional contract jobs I take on in my profession. The other savings account is only money from rental income, some of which I use to maintain the property and pay my dad back. The property is a multifamily home and I rent out all of the units but one. The property was bought by my dad when I was 24 and I've been paying him back the purchase price with no interest for a couple of years now. The property is worth a great amount now, but my dad would only accept what he paid for it from me. He took out a loan for me because he wanted me to be set up financially. I'm paying him back even though he already paid the loan off a long time ago. There's no way I would be able to buy that property now or even five years ago since house prices have skyrocketed where I live and I'm grateful that my dad did that for me. I will finally pay off the loan in about 8 months and before I get married. It's taken me so long to pay my dad back because he insisted that I prioritize setting myself up financially rather than paying him back. The property is also a 15 minute walk to the nearest hospital and close to the city center so it's easy to rent out to medical students. I keep one unit open because of events. 
I make a lot when there are events or when big artists tour, and two examples are the recent Beyonce and Taylor Swift tours. If there are no events that I can think of, I rent it out to travel nurses in three or four month periods once or twice a year. Overall though, I make a substantial amount from this property. I can't take credit for this strategy because my dad is the one who helped me set it up. My partner and I come from vastly different economic backgrounds. His family has generational wealth and he can't remember a time they didn't. I grew up firmly middle class until my parents divorced and then it was a struggle for a while. His home life was relatively stable with a mom and a dad. On the other hand, my dad tried his best, but my birth mom made my childhood tumultuous, both emotionally and mentally. The difference with how we think about money became very noticeable when we were planning our wedding. We had been discussing what type of flowers we would like, and then I started talking about my budget and stated that I thought thirty to 40000 was good overall to pay for a wedding and an amount where we could easily afford it. He thought I meant thirty to 40000 for flowers, and he and his parents didn't budge at that amount and just said okay. I clarified what I meant and I would never ever pay that amount for just flowers. When it comes to the plan, my fiancé knew about it as soon as we were exclusive. I don't agree with people saying I shouldn't have told him. To protect my assets in the prenuptial agreement, I had to. I also told him because I felt he deserved to know. As we got more serious, especially with marriage, I told him more after talking to my dad and finding out what was okay to say so that he understood the extent of the plan. I know this is a very small aspect of the overall story, but thirty to $40,000 for flowers for a wedding? How rich is his family? Looking at the details, OP is upper class, probably close to the top 1%, but not there yet. She owns a multi-million dollar property, has a trust fund, etc. Her boyfriend is so rich compared to her, she considered herself solidly middle class. So think $10 million mansion, driving expensive sport cars, never needing to work, $100 million in assets from his parents. She keeps calling herself poor or middle class, and I'm like, your dad bought you an apartment complex. I know this isn't really the point of this post, but I love how rich people will consider themselves middle class when they own multi-million dollar properties, multiple properties, large bank accounts, huge investment in retirement portfolios, etc. Like, I'm sure her parents' divorce was tough on her, but I'm highly doubting she struggled at all growing up post-divorce. Am I the jerk for telling my sister I won't be helping her with her second unplanned baby? My sister is an idiot. She had my niece when she was 19. She dropped out of college but didn't want to ruin her boyfriend's life so she never went after him for child support. The truth was that it wasn't his baby and she's not sure who the father actually was. I'm a fair bit older than her and I make a good living so I helped her out with money and free babysitting, that sort of thing. My niece is 5 years old now and she's basically a bonus kid for my family. Even my husband's family has sort of adopted her as one of our own. My sister just told me she's pregnant again. She hasn't mentioned a boyfriend, so I asked her what her relationship with the father was like. She said it was a Tinder guy and that he ditched his profile after she told him. I asked her what she was planning on doing. She said that she was having the baby. I told her that was great and I hoped that everything would work out for her. I added that I would not be giving her money to support her new baby and that I would not be babysitting for her. I'm back to work and I don't have that freedom anymore. I said that we would continue to help support my niece, but that was it, and that if she chose to use the help we were giving her for my niece for the new kid, we would have to stop helping at all. She lost it. She said that I'm judging her and how she chooses to live her life. I'm not. She can do whatever she wants, but she has no right to expect my husband and I to pick up the slack from her refusal to be a responsible person. It didn't take long for our mother to call me to go off on me for saying what I said to my sister. I asked her how much money she had given my sister for my niece and how much she was going to give her for the new kid. I said I would give my sister the same amount of money my mother gave me for each of my kids, the cost of a onesie from Walmart. She said I was a terrible daughter and sister for saying what I said. She said that if she had had more money, she would have given us more. I said she could sell her house up north now that she lives in Florida to help support my sister if she's really running out of money. She isn't. My dad left her well set up when he passed. OP didn't just buy a few onesies for her first niece. Believing the unplanned pregnancy with an unknown father was a once-in-a-lifetime event, she provided an extraordinary level of support. She contributed significant emotional, practical, and financial support. She's not in a position to do it all a second time. Being generous for the first kid does not oblige OP to do the same thing for the second. Better OP should tell her sister what to expect before the baby is born so she can plan accordingly. When someone is planning their life using magical thinking, you can't deliver bad news kindly. 
It's just ignored or dismissed. I'm afraid that if OP were less blunt, her sister would believe OP could be persuaded to change her mind. Not the jerk. Overall, not the jerk, but your point about only helping your older niece doesn't really make any sense. If you care about this kid, why would it bother you to see your money also going to help your other niece or nephew as well? You can choose whether or not to give your sister money, and you can choose how much you're comfortable giving, but specifically saying it should only go to one kid is strange. You're the jerk. You don't need to help, but it's entirely messed up to plan to support one of your nieces, but not the new niece or nephew. Just stop giving money at that point, because that would only cause a ton of issues. You're the jerk for planning to treat the kids differently. Their mother's choices are not their fault. Giving nothing is absolutely reasonable, but it isn't okay to give things to the older one and let the younger one watch. How absolutely horrible and cruel. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you keep giving her money for her second baby too or not? Please let us know. Alright, who's ready to place some bets on how long it takes for baby number three to show up? Am I the jerk for not letting my girlfriend crash at my place while she finds a new apartment? My girlfriend and I have been together for a little under two years now. Things have been going well, I think. Her roommate has moved out of state and now my girlfriend needs a place to stay temporarily. We both work and live in a fairly large city and it's not easy to find affordable arrangements. My place is pretty spacious, yes. However, it's just not suitable for anything more than one person. My uncle gave me this loft and the 50% of assets he didn't donate to charity and was a bachelor all of his life, which is definitely how the space is intended to be used. If I had to pay for a similar space in this part of the city, it would cost five to $6,000 a month in rent, which is about one-third of my pre-tax pay, so I definitely don't want to move anytime soon. If you don't know what a loft is, my bedroom is on another floor from the living room and kitchen area, but there's no physical wall between them. This means you can literally hear everything. Great for living by myself, not tolerable with anyone else long-term. That would mean I can't play on my PC in the bedroom late at night or watch TV in the living room. If you wake up in the middle of the night and want a quesadilla, you can definitely smell what's being cooked in the kitchen and hear the blower. There's also very little privacy anywhere besides the bathroom. I'm sure there are some entire families living in arrangements like this, but there are also families living in huts or closet apartments in Hong Kong. My girlfriend would have to commute 70 to 80 minutes to get here from her parents' house. However, she assured me that she would only need three months to find a place, so it's not as if that would be a long-term situation. There's plenty of people who commute every day. It's no big deal. I really don't think she has any reason to be so upset with me about not wanting to let her move in. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk for a specific reason. The fact that you care more about not being able to play video games at night than the fact that your girlfriend has to find a place to live temporarily says everything I need to know. You're the jerk. We get it. You aren't really into your girlfriend and don't care if she has to commute over an hour every morning and evening, so long as you can play games at night. Why haven't you broken up with her already? You clearly have no intentions of ever marrying her or moving in with her. You're just stringing her along. You're the jerk. Do you love this person and see a future with them someday? Or is she just a hookup buddy to you? If you love her, I can't imagine how you'd think it's okay to be so callous in her moment of need. If you don't love her or see a real future with her, maybe it's time to sit down and have a talk so she can decide if she's cool with that or she can move on to someone who does. The inconveniences you list pale in comparison to that of a long commute. You think it's reasonable for her to spend over two hours a day driving so you don't have to wear headphones at night when you watch TV? You might smell and hear cooking noises. Oh, the humanity. Are you going to be the type to get mad that she never has time to see you now that she has such a long commute? Then dump her for not being available. Everything you list is something you could work around for three months. I shared a loft with a boyfriend in college and it's not the end of the world. Not the jerk. Why is it that when a boyfriend demands to move in with his girlfriend, you all flip out on him and tell her to break up with him? But now that girlfriend is the one demanding to live with OP, he's the bad guy for not letting her. Another day, another double standard on Reddit. Don't let her move in with you. If you do, good luck with the eviction process you'll eventually have to use to get rid of her. And for the love of goodness, quit talking crap about dudes who like video games. You act like chicks scrolling through TikTok videos all day is somehow more productive. At least video games exercise your mind. They're actually really good for older people struggling with dementia, while TikTok just rots your brain. Come to think of it, maybe TikTok is what made most of you so dumb. My Karen neighbors and the cops are demanding to use my driveway. Going to begin by saying that legally I am in the clear. It's my property and I can do as I wish with it. 
I bought a piece of land and had a house built on it recently. There was a gravel road, now it's paved, that has become my driveway. I guess before I lived there, the locals used it to get around faster. I've been told that if they can't use my driveway, it makes the travel 15 minutes longer. This started when I moved in. The stuff like the yard and surrounding area was not finished, but it was complete enough to move in. My driveway is long and can be exited and entered from two sides. With how the house is built for them to use my driveway as a shortcut, a lot of traffic would have to pass right by my house and cars every day. This isn't just people driving. People on bikes and walkers want to use it too. I simply do not want the whole town using my driveway every day. I realized it was a problem when I moved in and I could constantly hear cars driving through all hours of the night or voices of people talking and people walking right past the cars. I understood that this property was vacant for a while, so I put up signs saying that this is private property. You can clearly see a house there and I'm sure they saw it being built. No change. So I put up gates that only my wife and I have access to. It doesn't deter the walkers, but I have plans for that. This caused a big fuss. I've had numerous people knock on my door asking why I put a gate up, saying they will be late to school or work. I had a guy say I made him late to an interview. I just tell everyone that this is private property and that this house didn't just appear here. You saw the signs if this was a route that you use daily. Apparently, the police used this as a speed trap area and I've had police ask me to open the gates. I tell them no. My wife normally is the type to let people use the driveway, but this wasn't normal. Imagine the whole town using it like a shortcut. There was so much traffic constantly. The first complaint I got before the gates were up was when I parked my car on the driveway and not on the part in front of my house because it was blocking the traffic. I responded, the traffic on my property? I've had cops tell me I'm obstructing their work. My direct neighbors understand, but town people are just upset that their shortcut is gone. They're all pretty upset about the house being here altogether. People would park their cars all over the driveway and my property during sporting events. High school football is important around here. I'm not trying to be an evil neighbor. Am I the jerk? Edit. For those wondering, yes, I've talked to lawyers and this is my property. I initially didn't want the two outlets because to me it looks odd. I only have one entrance to my driveway paved and the other one is gravel. I was just going to leave it, but now I will just remove the outlet entirely. My land is still under construction and there will be a fence going completely around my property. Not the jerk. It's your property and they can't use it anymore. They will just have to get used to going the long way around. If the locals wanted this road so much, then they should have had their town purchase the land and made it a public road. They didn't. Now they have to deal with it. Not the jerk. It's your home and your property. Seriously, building a home takes time. They should have realized things were changing. And the cops don't need to use your property as a speed trap. You're the jerk. This is why I disagree with the concept of private property. Because you want to make people's lives more difficult than they already are, you're trying to stop them from using a road that they've used since long before you arrived. Why can't you just be cool and respect that this is a helpful road to everyone? Except the police. I wouldn't let them use it either. I make their lives harder anytime I can because we just don't need them at all. But that's another story. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or everyone else? Please let us know. Whenever you have trouble with people using your driveway and you want them to stop, nails can really come in handy. My husband ate some of my chocolate, so I made him drive across the city to replace it. I'm eight and a half months pregnant and driving sucks. So my mom drives me around because my husband is working long hours to get ahead before the baby comes. Last month, she drove me to my favorite chocolate store and I stocked up on my favorite flavors. The store has dozens of flavors of chocolate individually wrapped in colorful foil so you can tell the flavor. The store is about an hour's drive away from our home. My husband knows my favorite flavor. Half the bag was originally that flavor, but by now it's just even with the others. He came home from work yesterday and after supper we were going to sit and watch TV. I waddled over to the couch and asked him to please bring me two of my chocolates. He did and he grabbed a few for himself. No problem there. He came back to the couch with chocolates in his mouth. When he kissed me, I knew what flavor he took. He admitted he took the Stracciatella ones, my favorite. I got kind of upset and he said it was no big deal. I could go with my mom and get some more. Yes, this company sells their chocolate everywhere, but that flavor, I've only ever seen this flavor in their store. I asked if he's been eating that flavor a lot 
and his face told me everything I needed to know. I yelled at him that it's not like it's easy for me to sit in a car for two hours. He said he would go out right now and replace them. He hit a couple of stores and a couple of grocery stores and they all told him the same thing. He drove across town and came back with a big bag of just that flavor. While he was gone, I called my mom and she said I need to calm down because my hormones are making me crazy. I apologized to my husband, but he's still grumpy that he drove around for hours just to get me chocolate. I think he should know better than to eat my favorite flavor. I know this isn't as big a problem as some of the other stuff on here. Edit. My husband is wonderful and he went out looking to replace my chocolate. After he didn't find it nearby, he chose to drive across town. I didn't force him to do it. When I said I made him do it, I meant he did it to make me happy. Sorry for any confusion. I clearly recall sobbing during my first pregnancy over a brand of potato chips that was discontinued and my husband came home with an unsuitable, to me, replacement. It was ridiculous. And years later, we laugh about it. So will you. Best wishes for a smooth birth and a healthy baby. I vividly remember when I was pregnant with my son, ordering Hawaiian barbecue from a local restaurant, specifically the teriyaki beef. My partner went to pick it up and they had forgotten to include the teriyaki sauce that comes on the side, but it also is what makes it so delicious. And you know, teriyaki. I cried hysterically and couldn't even rationalize why I was so upset. My partner, bless him, drove back to the store and came back with boatloads of teriyaki sauce. I'm not proud of that moment, in hindsight, but pregnancy really does make you a bit nuts and food cravings are no joke. Not the jerk. In a year, you will both be laughing about this. This is the real marriage stuff no one talks about. You're a team. You're hormonal and pregnant. He went and got your special chocolate. I'd probably just start cracking jokes about it and say sorry for being a bit extra. You're the jerk. Wife yells at her husband. Ha ha, this is funny. Husband yells at wife. He's a monster. You need to divorce him. You deserve so much better. Wife says she made her husband do something or allowed him to do something. Nobody bats an eye. Husband says this kind of stuff. Everyone loses their mind. Read it in a nutshell. P.S. Being pregnant doesn't excuse you for acting like a total jerk. I'm so sick of hearing that it does. P.P.S. For all you geniuses who are upset by my comment, I'm a woman now in my 60s. I've had three pregnancies throughout my life and never felt the need to act like a jerk to anyone because I was pregnant. Sure, there were days where I felt horrible, but I never took that out on my husband or anyone else. Just because you don't feel good does not excuse you to mistreat others. I'd love to see how you bozos react to a story where the husband is sick and he's the one treating people like crap. Karen mother steals my car, now I'm suing her. I, 24 male, live with my mom in a rural part of the USA. For context, when it comes to my sister, 37, she's much older and we come from different fathers and we grew up in split custody arrangements. We are not particularly close, almost acquaintances more so than siblings. I don't really feel any family connection, even though I love her. I don't feel obligated to bend over backwards for her. Well, sister lives two hours away, in a much more urban area, and is currently going through a divorce. Her and her ex-husband only had one vehicle, and it belongs to the ex-husband. So when they split, he took the car. Sister has four daughters and works a full-time job. I, on the other hand, work from home, and I have no real external responsibilities. My mom came to me asking if my sister could borrow my car for a couple of months until the divorce is finalized, so she has a way of transporting her and her kids to wherever they need to go without the financial burden of purchasing another car or relying exclusively on ride sharing. I just recently bought my car, 2012 V8 Mustang, and it's my first vehicle ever. I didn't get a hand-me-down or get one as a present when I turned 16 or 18. I was basically immobile except occasionally being allowed to drive my mom's car or when my dad had me, I could get Ubers. Getting my own vehicle was extremely liberating, minus the loan, and I don't feel trapped at home anymore. So when I was approached with this proposal, I flat out said no. I can totally understand the justification for letting her use my car for a couple months, but aside from the fact I don't want to lose my newfound sense of freedom, I also just don't want someone else driving my car, and maybe that's selfish of me. Over the last few days, my mom and sister have been trying to convince me to let her use the car, saying that she would pay me for the car payment while she has the car, or that she'd pay for insurance if she has it longer than anticipated. No matter what they brought to the table, I kept saying no, much to their dissatisfaction. Fast forward to this morning. I realize that my mom isn't home. 
I opened the garage to see that her car was still there, but mine wasn't. I immediately knew what had happened and I call my mom about the situation. She just tries to calm me down and has me try to picture it from my sister's point of view, but I'm just flushed with rage and instead, I just tell her that I'm going to report the vehicle is stolen instead. She just hung up the phone. As of now, I presume my car is down with my sister and I'm seriously considering reporting it stolen and naming her and my sister as perpetrator and conspirator. I really don't want it to go that far and I hope that we can just work it out instead. But what I initially said as an angry threat, I'm starting to really consider as an option. I just don't know if it's worth burning so many bridges over a car, but the fact that my family won't respect my boundaries or my property is so frustrating. Would I be the jerk? Update. I ended up giving mom and sister an ultimatum to return my car by 5 p.m. And if they didn't, I would be reporting them to the police. And if they did, I would let bygones be bygones and move on and move out. I even offered to pitch in a bit to help my sister get a new vehicle. Car has been returned, so the police will not need to be involved. However, there's body damage that wasn't there the last time I used it. Can't tell if it was intentional damage or not, but it honestly doesn't matter. We'll be getting all relevant papers in order, and then I'll be lawyering up so the damages will all be paid for. As soon as this entire situation is resolved, I will be moving out. I've learned to never keep my keys out ever again. Thanks so much for the input and advice. To address a few questions that I keep getting asked, mom has her own car but doesn't want to lend hers out because she needs it for work every day. I had offered to let her use mine for work and she lend out her car to sister but she refuted this idea saying that she doesn't feel comfortable driving my car and that she needs ample space for medical supplies. She's an in-home nurse. I'm well aware that my living situation will change if I call the police on my mom and sister but honestly, the living situation is already compromised. Regardless of the resolution, I will be moving out as immediately as possible, as soon as I'm financially stable enough to do so. This whole thing is just the straw that broke the camel's back. I've been getting a lot of comments regarding living for free at my mother's house. We split the bill 60-40 on basically everything. It's not truly 50-50, but absolutely by no means am I freeloading at my mom's house. Karen's cheating gets exposed, now she's blaming me. I, 34 female, have been married to my husband, who's 35, for almost a year now, and we dated for three years before that. Ever since we started dating, whenever we go out without the other one, we both let each other know where we are and when we arrive and leave as a safety thing. Example, hey, I just got to the bar, everything's fine, or I'm leaving the bar in an Uber and I should be home in 10 minutes. Now this weekend, I went out with my friend Amy, not her real name. We went to a restaurant and to dance. Around 2 a.m., we decided to go home, and because we live in opposite directions, we each took a different Uber. As usual, I texted my husband to let him know I was going home, and he told me that he was also leaving his friend's house, and we should arrive at the same time. I knew he was out with some of his friends that included Amy's fiancé as well, as we've all known each other for a long time. But I wasn't really thinking about that, just following my routine. We both got home, I texted Amy to let her know I was home safe, and I went to bed. When I woke up the next morning, I had tons of messages and a few missed calls from Amy. My husband also had messages and calls from Amy's fiancé. In her text, she was asking me what I had told her fiancé, what had my husband told her fiancé, how dare we meddle in their relationship, etc. The texts on my husband's phone were just asking if I had arrived home and if he had any idea where Amy was. I called Amy and again, she asked me what I had told her fiancé. I told her I hadn't spoke with him and she lost it on me because if I didn't speak with him, then how did he know that I had left at 2 a.m.? I explained to her that I had texted my husband as I always do. She said I'm a jerk for not telling her that I was doing that and that my husband is controlling for making me text him and for telling her fiancé that she was also leaving. Then she hung up and hasn't picked up again. My husband said he only told his friends that we were leaving because he wanted to arrive at home at the same time as me and that if my friend did something wrong, I don't know what, that's on her, not me. The thing is, this has reached my other friends, and some are saying that I should text my husband when I arrive home, not when I leave the club, and that I'm a jerk for not telling Amy what I was texting my husband. Some agree with my husband and say this is on Amy for lying. She told her fiancé that we both stayed dancing later, and not on me for texting my husband. Honestly, I don't know what to think, as I feel like maybe I should just text my husband arriving home instead to avoid compromising others or to avoid creating an imaginary curfew for my friends. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Update. 
I haven't heard Amy's version of what happened during that hour and a half that she was missing, but her fiancé told my husband that everything is fine and the reason that she was late was because she decided to walk home while smoking and didn't want him to know and be disappointed that she's smoking again. As of the wedding, so far that's still happening, but I'm no longer part of the bridal party as Amy considers me no longer part of her trust circle. I'm still invited to the wedding, but as my husband's plus one because he's still part of the groomsmen. I'm glad I'm not a bridesmaid anymore and I'm not sure if I'll be comfortable going to the wedding because Amy and most of her bridesmaids act as if I was trash talking her to her fiance when I haven't even spoken to him. I'm sorry to break it to you OP, but the reality is she's still upset because she had something major to hide and smoking isn't it. You know it, all of Reddit knows it, and I'm sure deep down her future husband knows it, but he's too deep in denial. Just as long as your husband doesn't start defending her, I just sit back and wait for the inevitable implosion of their marriage. OP I personally think it's not my place to assume what Amy did or didn't do in her spare time. I keep my side of the street clean and it's up to her to keep hers. And as for my husband, he's not particularly close to Amy. He just wants to be able to support her friend when he needs it. Update 2 I've heard all of this from my husband and a few friends I still have in common with Amy and Amy's sister, who's very angry at her. Turns out that as many had assumed Amy wasn't being faithful. This past weekend, she went dancing with some friends and didn't come home until 5 a.m. Of course, she told her ex-fiancé that she had been out with her friends all the time and that's why she didn't answer her phone. Only for him to tell her that because she wasn't home and wasn't picking up the phone, around 2.30 a.m., he called one of her friends to ask to speak to her. And lo and behold, the friend had no idea where Amy was because they had gone dancing all right, but Amy canceled on them and didn't go. So she insisted that she was dancing with her sister and her sister's friends, but instead she was doing something else. He called Amy's sister to ask her, at what time did Amy leave the club to come home? Because he remembered that Amy went dancing with me. And the sister said she hadn't seen Amy either. So he finally confronted her, and after more excuses, she admitted that she was with a work friend. At first, she said it was just a friend that she didn't mention because it's a guy and her fiancé would be jealous. But after more fighting and circling, she told him that it was just a bit of pre-wedding fun, nothing serious, and that it wasn't cheating because they didn't actually hook up and it was only flirting and hanging out, alone at his apartment. So he called off the wedding because he doesn't approve of this kind of pre-wedding fun. He's staying with some friends and she's calling everyone she can think of to ask us to talk to him to get the wedding back on. I don't get why some people treat the run-up to their wedding as their last chance to go wild and act single. The last chance was before you agreed to be in a committed relationship. Yes, even before you were engaged. If you're already cheating, you won't magically stop because you got a ring on your finger. You'll just find new ways to justify it. Having some pre-golden anniversary fun. If you expect someone to be an alibi for your cheating, it's up to you to make sure they know that and agree to it. Amy's a jerk. As a woman myself, I always laugh when these girlfriends or wives go out to bars and clubs without their man then dude acts surprised when he gets cheated on. Your girl is not going there to just hang out with her friends. She's looking for something on the side, and everyone knows that, they just don't like to admit it. My husband and I decided early on that we weren't going to have any of that in our relationship, and now we're going on 10 years of a happy marriage. Y'all need Jesus. Am I the jerk for telling my vegan sister that she can't serve only vegan food at our family reunion? Every year, our family has a reunion where different members host. This year, it's my younger sister's turn. She's been vegan for about three years and is quite passionate about it. We all respect her choices and we make sure there's a good variety of vegan options whenever we have family gatherings. When she's announced that she'll be hosting, she also said that the entire menu would be vegan to align with her beliefs and that it's a chance for the family to try something different. Some family members were excited, but others, including many of the older folks, were pretty upset and felt like they were being forced into her lifestyle even if just for one meal. I spoke to her privately and asked if she'd be open to including a few non-vegan dishes for those of us who aren't keen on a full vegan menu. She got quite defensive, saying that this was her chance to showcase veganism and that for one meal, everyone can let it go. I respect her beliefs, but I also think that forcing an entire family to adopt her choices, even if just for one meal, isn't fair. She's now upset with me for not being supportive and says I'm not respecting her choices. Am I the jerk? Update. I thought I'd answer a couple of questions. 1. There is no set rotation. The hosting goes to whoever wants to host, 
or hasn't hosted before. In this case, she wanted to host. We have managed to come to a compromise where people can bring their own food as long as it doesn't contain meat, which I think is fair. And just for some more context, she works at a well-known UK fast food place, so she has no issues handling or preparing or serving meat, although I get that this can be different at home. You're the jerk. I get it's not what you usually look forward to or are used to with meals, but it's one meal. I grew up with two vegetarian friends, their whole family, and when they had me over, even as a kid, I knew I shouldn't expect or ask for meat. You say you respect her beliefs, but want her to go against them for you all in her own home. Veganism is based on a strongly held personal belief related to their morals, and in that way it's similar to a religion. There's still tons of variety and delicious options with vegan food. So much. Be more open-minded to something different for one meal. If you really expect to just completely hate any meal with no animal products, smash a burger beforehand and politely pick at whatever looks best when you're there. Eh, uh, I get you, but she's accommodated at everyone else's house. She has no interest in reciprocating that courtesy. She too can smash a vegan meal beforehand and just pick at whatever looks okay for her when she's visiting, no? It goes both ways. Also, she's not being a great host and that you want your guests to be comfortable. All the rules that would apply to her being taken care of at other people's houses apply to her hosting as well. Finally, she's using the meal to showcase veganism. So it's part reunion party, part evangelizing. Neat. Everyone sucks here. They should all be more flexible. You're the jerk. It's one meal and she'll be serving food that everyone can eat. And it's perfectly possible for her to be an amazing host without catering to people's preference for meat dishes. If a friend whose religion forbids pork invites me to their place for breakfast, the fact there's no bacon with my pancakes isn't forcing their beliefs on me. But if I ask them to provide bacon because it's my preference, I'd for sure be disrespecting their beliefs. I agree. She hosts, she cooks, so she decides the menu. Others don't get a say in the menu unless it's a food allergy or intolerance, but individual and personal preferences don't really matter. At least not when there are several guests invited and not just one or two guests she hosts. You're the jerk. I've been a vegan for over 20 years. I wouldn't attempt to cook meat for someone. I wouldn't even know where to start. I'd order food with meat in it, or I would be fine with someone bringing a meat dish they prepared. Everyone has different comfort levels with meat and with vegan food. Not the jerk. Leave it to Reddit to crucify the guy who just doesn't want to eat vegan. Here's your problem, bud. You're trying to reason with a vegan. That's pretty much impossible to do. They don't get the vital nutrients their bodies need, so their brains don't work properly. Can't wait till this vegan fad goes away. It's nothing but overly privileged folks who don't have enough actual problems to complain about, so they just find more. I'd get together with the rest of your family and decide on someone else who doesn't insist on eating nothing but salad to host your dinner. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his sister? Please let us know. I feel like Reddit either sides with the vegan or against the vegan, depending on whether or not OP is the vegan. Am I the jerk for misleading my cousin and destroying his marriage? There's some really weird drama in my family and I feel like I'm going insane. So here's the background. My family is a little unusual. There are three of us adults and we have two kids. We have me, my wife, and another woman best described as my wife's platonic life partner and also my very dear friend. I'll call her Sally. Sally has lived with us for 20 years. The kids call her Ma. We live in a four bedroom house and Sally and the kids each have their own rooms. Sally is aromantic and ace. She and my wife love each other very much, but platonically. Sally is like a sister to me. I cannot overstate how incredibly platonic her relationships with both of us have always been. We're all very happy together. I've been super glad we have her since we had the kids. Parenting is so much easier when you have a numbers advantage. My cousin, Dave, has been married to his wife, Mary, for something like 15 years. They have two kids. Dave talked Mary into opening the relationship about a year ago, and now they're getting divorced because he's struggling to find anyone willing to date him. Mary isn't, and he's incredibly upset about it, and it's destroying their relationship. And by it's, I kinda mean he's. He's jealous and resentful and making that her problem. And also, now my problem, because he says it's my fault. According to him, he thought it would totally work great because my family makes open relationships look easy. What? Setting aside that Sally's relationships with both my wife and me are platonic, there's no open relationship in our household. 
Sally and I each get a weekly date night with my wife. I take the kids on her night, she takes them on mine. I did say parenting is easier with a numbers advantage. I think my wife and I have significantly more quality time together than we would if it was just the two of us. When the kids can't sleep, they go to Sally, so my wife and I are never disturbed after we go to bed. Sometimes Sally and I go to games together, and my wife takes the kids then because she's not into sports. No one in our house is dating anyone from outside of it. These are committed relationships that are, to all intents and purposes, exclusive. None of us have ever mentioned seeing anyone else. Even if we were, which again, we're not, I don't see how that would make me responsible for him treating Mary wrong because he's jealous. Somehow, he was apparently convinced that he and his beer gut would get all the girls, but no men would be interested in a charming, kind woman who keeps herself in reasonable shape and bakes the best cupcakes you will ever taste. I had dismissed this as out of my hand, but my aunt, his mother, and like six other family members agree that I'm the jerk and have been insisting I should apologize to my idiot cousin and help him talk Mary into closing the relationship and staying with him. I like Mary. We've been friends for 20 years and she's good people. Also friends with my wife and Sally and a wonderful aunt to my kids. Given the choice between her and Dave, I'd keep Mary in the family along with her kids. Someone in my family is insane here. Is it me or them? Who's the jerk? Am I the jerk for telling my sister-in-law she should cancel the baby shower she was planning for me? My husband and I are expecting our first baby in a few months and my sister-in-law offered to throw us a baby shower. I was really in love with the idea and accepted and then my mother-in-law got involved. But my sister-in-law disrespected the one clear boundary regarding the baby shower that I had and she refuses to let it go despite being told not only by me but mother-in-law and my husband as well. She insisted that my half-siblings should be invited as well as finding biological family from both sides and inviting them. This is an absolutely never thing for me. I did not invite them to my wedding and I have not seen or spoken to them in several years. But she's going extremely hard on the but family argument. Background. I'm an affair baby. My father cheated on his wife and I was the result. His wife kicked him to the curb and he and my mother stayed together. I was born and they did not take care of me and when I was three I was removed from their care. None of my biological family wanted me. My mother's family were supposedly good Christians who couldn't stand the thought of an illegitimate affair baby and my father's family were not in the position to take care of me. My father's ex-wife ended up taking me in. I'm not sure why. The fact she was paid to take care of me was possibly the reason. I do know I was not loved. My half-siblings ranged from 11 to 17 at the time and they couldn't stand me. It was made perfectly clear to me from a young age that I was never to call her mom and I was never to call them my brothers and sisters. My father's family were still in their lives and knew how I was treated and they didn't care. My childhood was miserable and I was seen as a burden. My half-siblings continued visiting their mom as adults and all just made it clear they couldn't stand me. I just left when I was 16 and nobody ever came looking for me. My sister-in-law knows my background and she knows that I would never want them in my life again. But push she continues to do. And I spoke to my mother-in-law and she tried to take over more, but sister-in-law insisted that she had offered first. When she brought it up again, I told her to cancel the shower and I would rather have no baby shower than to have one thrown by her when she can't respect my boundaries. Mother-in-law stepped in and is now hosting one, but sister-in-law is upset because she had spent a while planning and had paid for some stuff already. Mother-in-law said she'd give her the money back, but sister-in-law said I was in the wrong and I should appreciate her for wanting to give me back my family. I told her I had no family until I met them, and she needs to accept that my blood relatives do not want me, and I don't want them. I know she keeps telling my husband how wrong I was, and he keeps defending me, but I feel bad about the tension now. Am I the jerk? You already know the answer, right? Not the jerk. The arrogance of your sister-in-law, though. Imagine being that full of your own self-importance to directly go against your wishes because you think you know better. I'm really sorry, OP, but people who come from decent families can have absolutely no idea what it's like to come from a bad one. I don't talk about my own very bad family among normal respectable people because they just aren't going to understand, and there's good odds that they wouldn't even believe the truth. I don't believe my mom's excuse for bailing on me while I was in labor. I, 28 female, recently gave birth to my second. My parents, who are 57 and 58, live six minutes from my husband and I, 
So our game plan was when I go into labor, my parents would come and watch our first kid while we were at the hospital. My dad is very involved with our daughter, who's two, but my mom often skips out on playdates and dinners I set up because she's too tired from work or doesn't feel up to it. For clarification, she works six to eight hours a day as a receptionist in a medical clinic. My parents were ecstatic to be able to watch her while I would be at the hospital because they would be the first ones to meet the new baby then. Well, I went into labor two weeks early on a Friday and my dad was out of town for work and wouldn't be home until Sunday evening. I called my mom and she said she would be there, but she had to run to Target first. She got to our house two and a half hours later. I was freaking out because I went quickly with my first and they said you go faster with the second. Whatever, she got there and when we laid out all the instructions and said we would probably be discharged late Sunday or early Monday, she was visibly surprised. She asked if we really thought it would be all weekend and she would need to cancel plans. I asked then and there if we should bring my daughter with and call my in-laws to meet us at the hospital. My mom said it was fine and she would happily watch her. My in-laws are amazing with our daughter and are definitely the more involved grandparents, but they live further away, about 40 minutes, and my husband and I were worried it would take too long for them to get to our house. My mom called us early on Saturday morning, 5.30ish, and said she had a headache and couldn't watch our toddler, and asked us to call my in-laws to come get her. My husband called his parents and they literally showed up in their PJs at 6.15am. I called my older sister to vent about how unreliable our mom was and how I thought she faked a headache to get out of watching our daughter. My dad is the one that plays with her, gets meals ready, and does bedtime on the few occasions they have to babysit her. I said she just wanted to get out of it because my dad wasn't there to actually do the work. For background, my mom used the headache excuse very often when I was growing up to get out of family things and have alone time at the house, brother's football games, church, visiting in-laws, etc. Well, my sister asked my dad if it was legit or if she was just trying to get out of it when she realized what a big commitment it was. My dad told my mom, and when my parents came to meet the new baby for the first time, she told me I was a jerk for thinking she would fake a headache to get out of the responsibility. I can't shake the feeling that she lied about it, and I've taken a step back from including them with my family's events with the kids. I don't know if this is the right move or if this is me being petty. I'm tired of being the one to initiate all contact and visits with my mom and my kids when she doesn't make an effort to have a relationship with them on her own. Is it fair of me to pull back and stop being the one to initiate her seeing my kids? My mom has no barriers to healthcare and has been asked by my dad, siblings, and I to be evaluated by a neurologist, and she has always refused, saying they aren't that bad. This is the first and only time I've ever asked my mother to babysit alone. In the two years of my daughter, Collective, they have babysat maybe five to six times for two to three hours. This is not a regular request and they are not common caretakers for my daughter by any means. My mom has been a flake my entire life. This is more of a recent thing in the last few years. She was a good mom growing up and is now pretty indifferent. I can call her and she won't call me back. Same with tech, so our relationship as mother and daughter is pretty low communication and I've accepted that. However, she makes a lot of comments about how she doesn't get to see the kids or gets upset when my daughter won't give her a hug when she asks. My husband and I have repeatedly told her that my daughter doesn't have to show her affection if she doesn't want to and my mom will continuously ask for a hug. I should have called my in-laws from the beginning when I knew my dad wouldn't be available, but I honestly had hoped she would step up given the situation. And y'all, I don't even know how to address the target thing. I have no idea why that was necessary or why it took as long as it did. Whether the headache was real or not almost doesn't matter. I can't believe she kept you waiting for hours so she could go to Target. That's a bizarre choice and demonstrates that she doesn't care. Parking in front of my house? I have a house with dedicated street parking spots in front of it. I also have a two-car garage, so I usually park in the garage. I have a new neighbor who lives on the side street with no street parking that has six cars. They alternate which car is parked in front of my house between the truck, their SUV, and their squad car. There is no assigned parking and I generally don't care other than the truck is loud enough that I can hear it in the house and they usually use remote start and let it idle for 5-10 to 10 minutes before they get in it. This is a lifted full-size V6 truck with a terrible sounding exhaust and the thin blue line stickers, etc. Total Chud Mobile. I went to grill something which required me to move my car, so I moved it to the spot in front of my house since it was open. I'm lazy and just haven't folded the grill up so I left my car parked there for a couple of days. I then ran to the grocery store for about 10 minutes at 9.30pm to grab a few things before they closed. 
When I got back, they had moved their lifted truck into the spot in front of my house from the spot across the street. I was shocked at how petty it was, like genuinely impressed, but given that they are a cop, this was less than a surprise and probably an indication they should not have the job they have if this is how petty they are, but I digress. So I used my doorbell camera to set up a motion zone notification for the parking spot. I got a notification and heard the truck start up and they left, so I moved my car one spot forward to the spot in front of my house. They came back 10 minutes later, I could hear the truck and I checked the doorbell camera. I told my partner about this and they think it's hilarious and fully endorse using their car to go places so we can leave mine in the spot in front of the house. Since I work from home, I don't use my car much. It's been there for about 6 days now. Tomorrow we go on a 2 week vacation and I'm just going to leave it parked in the spot. I checked the HOA bylaws, there's no limitation on how long a car can be parked there as long as it's registered for road use. I'm really only doing this because they obviously care enough to come out and move their car minutes after I left. I genuinely don't care but think it's hilarious they feel entitled to the spot in front of my house when they have 6 cars and bought a house with a 2 car garage, which they only park 1 car in. I'm debating on buying a second car just to leave it in the spot. Am I being too petty? Is it just a jerk move to leave it there while I'm on vacation? I was thinking about it, but my partner suggested I leave it there while we're on vacation. One of the many reasons we're together, I guess. Okay, but you don't own the street. OP. True, but neither does he, so I'll continue to do as I please within the boundaries of the law. You lost me on your first sentence. Your house has dedicated street parking spots in front of it? Do you mean public parking for anyone who has a car? How do you claim ownership of those spots, or are they on your property? Maybe I'm missing something here. OP. Yes, they're dedicated, painted parking spots on the street, not assigned parking, and not just parking on the side of the street impeding the flow of traffic. I'm not claiming ownership over the spot. It happens to be directly in front of my house. I parked there for a couple of days. When I left the space for 10 minutes, my neighbor moved their car back, which indicated they were watching, waiting for the spot. So I waited for them to move and have parked there and will park there for roughly a month. Since I'm anyone who has a car, I'm allowed to be petty and park there too. This is called petty revenge. I thought this was petty and appropriate. Am I the jerk for expecting my son to share his room? Background. My, 40 female, husband, 40 male, and I bought a three-bedroom house a few years ago, shortly before lockdown. We, of course, took the master bedroom, and the other two bedrooms went to our kids, who were then 12 and 10. We put a very nice double bed in the larger room and a single bed in the smaller room, and told them both that they could choose their rooms, but whoever ended up in the larger room may be asked to share or relocate for visiting family members, while whoever ended up in the smaller room would have it to themselves always. We almost never have family over. Hubby and I are both only kids, and our parents are in other provinces. So we were surprised when our older daughter chose the smaller room and our younger son chose the larger room. But okay, they worked it out between themselves. Both seemed happy with the choice, so okay. And it has remained that way for a couple of years. Now, we have a four-day weekend coming up. My kids are now 15 and 12, and my mother decided to come down to visit. Of course, we told her okay, my husband and I, as we hadn't seen each other in a while, and I told our son, with the larger room and bed, that grandma would be here for a few days and would be using his bed. Well, my son threw a fit. He didn't want to share a room with grandma, not even on an air mattress, not even for three nights. She smells funny. So we reminded him of the original deal and offered to put the air mattress in the living room, but that wasn't enough. He'd have no privacy there. His sister offered to let him put the air mattress in her room, which she wasn't required to do, and that wasn't okay either. My husband and I offered to let him put the air mattress in our room, and he said no to that, because sharing a room with your parents, ugh, God bless the privilege, but whatever. Finally, I put my foot down and said, the condition of you having the bigger room was that you'd give it up for visiting family members, so one way or another, you're sleeping on an air mattress for three nights. You can choose if the air mattress goes in your room, or our room, or the living room, or literally any room in this house, but you are sleeping on an air mattress while grandma is here. Shortly after that confrontation, my husband came to me and suggested that we encourage my mom to stay in a hotel. I asked him who was going to pay for that hotel, since she can't afford it, we can't afford to put her up, and he went silent. Now he's calling me the jerk for forcing our son to give up his room for all of three nights, and suggesting that I tell my mom not to come at all, since apparently none of us can afford it. Edit. 
I sincerely appreciate everyone's comments and judgments, but I have officially reached the point where every time I look at my notifications, it adds two every second without me even having to hit refresh. Clearly, I should have posted this on my main account since apparently Reddit karma is important in some way. To follow the common am I the jerk trend and respond to some common themes. 1. Why don't I offer my own and my husband's bed to my mom? My husband has back problems, so also cannot viably sleep on an air mattress. I will not be going into detail on this. I also assume that it will be incredibly obvious to everyone why it is not viable for my husband and my mother to sleep in one together while I sleep on an air mattress. Not to mention that she would never allow me to give up my bed for her as a visitor. 2. Why doesn't my mom sleep on the couch or air mattress? She's 83 years old. Need I say more? 3. Anything involving my son and daughter switching rooms? My daughter is willing to help in the short term, but she seems a bit smug right now about the overall room choice, so she has no desire to switch rooms. And I will not force her, because what kind of parent would I be if I hold my son to the letter of his deal, but go back on my word to my daughter? You may decide I'm the jerk, and I'll accept that, but I'm not a hypocrite. 4. I'm fully aware of the privacy that my son needs. We've had that conversation, and at the prompting of a couple of commenters, I have also recently asked my husband if there was a private conversation between him and my son that would in some way change the situation. He said no. Since I do not currently have any reason to believe my husband would lie to me outright, I'm considering that conversation closed. 5. Rest in peace my DMs apparently. I didn't know that happened to 40-something married moms, but please know that I'm not interested. Not the jerk. Your son sounds a bit entitled if he can't survive three nights on an air mattress while his grandmother is there. Expecting him to share a bed or a room with her would be excessive, but there are presumably other spaces in a three-bedroom house where he could crash. Edit. To all the people saying you're the jerk because a 12-year-old needs privacy, safe space, etc., I can't help but think how entitled a society we've become. In the past decades, two to three kids would share a room through their entire child and teenage years, and even today, there are tons of kids living in miserable conditions in slums, refugee camps, and other similar situations. And OP is being called a jerk for telling her son that he has to vacate his room for three nights while his 60 or 70-something-year-old grandma visits so that she doesn't have to sleep on an air mattress or stay in a hotel? Just wow. I second this. People are also forgetting that this was a pre-made arrangement. If the son didn't want to share, he could have picked the smaller room. But no, he wanted the bigger one, so he needs to abide by the condition put in place. Like, it's three days. He needs to get over himself, acting as if it's for three months. Not the jerk. This sub is obviously full of kids who think three days on an air mattress, which he agreed to, is akin to some form of mistreatment that will leave him scarred well into his adult life. I think he can give his grandmother his bed and stop being a brat, which nothing against him, but is fairly typical kid behavior. I occasionally had to do the same for my grandparents. In hindsight, it was obviously the right call. You're not putting your elderly parents on a darn air mattress. That's insanity. Not the jerk. You've made the conditions clear, and now he isn't happy that they're happening to him. For context, I'm the oldest of three and had a similar arrangement. I chose the biggest and best room after my parents, which also had a bathroom next door that essentially became my private bathroom. The arrangement was that I was always the one who had to give up the room to guests, also because I got a double bed. While I didn't love giving up my room, I understood that was the price of having such a good room to begin with. Also, I usually would give up my room for one or two weeks at a time. A four-day weekend is nothing. Your son got the room he wanted and is now looking to renege on the deal. You've given him various options, but it's clear he simply does not intend to keep his word. Your husband thinks the person to compromise to his tantrums is your guest, but there is another option. He loses the room entirely and it goes to your daughter going forward. You're the jerk. I'm a certified youth counselor. I work with kids and parents on a day-to-day -day basis. If there's one thing that kids absolutely need, it's a safe space where they can have privacy. By invading your son's safe space and forcing him to share a room with his grandma, someone he doesn't even like, you're doing him a huge disservice that I guarantee you will cause lifelong issues. I tell parents as a general rule of thumb, if you don't have a spare bedroom, then don't allow family to stay at your house for anything longer than a day visit. What you're doing is showing your son that your feelings and his grandmother's feelings are more important than his, which will cause him to resent you both. There's been so much research that has gone into what makes kids go no contact with their parents once they leave home, and this is exactly what you're setting yourself up for. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for not putting your son first, 
If you refuse to trust the clinical studies that have been done, how about trusting the adult child of a family where this exact same thing happened to me? My grandpa Ed would stay over all the time and I was forced to share my room with him. I hated the way he always smelled like cheese <laughs> and the sound of when he spoke. He sounded so old. I cringe now just thinking about it. He never stopped talking and always had boring black and white shows on my TV. I got so fed up with him that one night I made sure that this would never be a problem again. Nobody ever found out what I did and I never regretted it. My dad fell into a deep depression and started drinking because his father was pretty much his best friend. But that's what happens when you cross the wrong person. Don't be surprised if you end up in the exact same situation. I wouldn't blame your son one bit. Dude, did this guy do what I think he did? Yowza canalza. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their son? Please let us know. I think that last commenter was the jerk. They should be locked up. Don't want to pay me for my work? All right, I'll undo it. I'm naming the company name because I've had many issues with them and everyone should be warned. So, I have to say this first. Beware of working for the delivery service shipped. Today, I picked up an order for delivery. It had gone promo, money added on, on shipped. It was for delivery in a town that is 15 minutes from the store of purchase. All right, not too bad for $16, especially since I live within 10 minutes of the town I was delivering to. I take it. I go to the store, receive the groceries, and I'm on my merry way. I send a text to the customer that I'm on my way and will reach them before this time. No response, so I give a quick call. It does a weird thing and ends. Doesn't even go to voicemail. Huh, whatever. I sent them a text. Get to the house. Knock. No answer. Leave the bag outside the door and I walk away. Make it to my car. Start the car. The woman pokes her head out on the porch door as I'm about to leave. You were very lovely, woman on the porch. Thank you for your kindness. Waves me down, looking highly confused. So I, unfortunately, stop the car and get out. The woman asks what this is. Why, your order, ma'am, I say, looking all happy. I didn't order anything, she says. Oh, no. Did anyone else in the house? Nope. Oh, no, no, no. So there's a wrong address on the delivery. I've never dealt with this before, and I have to leave to catch a movie with friends in 30 minutes. Cue me going door to door at each house on that small street while reaching out to ship support and while trying to call the customer again. Does the same weird thing with the phone. I give up on that. I proceed to knock on doors. Nope, nope, nope. No bodies. All right. Ship suggestion? Just drive back and return it. Um, no, shipped. I'm a delivery contractor. I'm not a volunteer, nor am I a charity. I'm hired by you to fulfill deliveries. As far as I'm concerned, I've delivered to the address on file. I'm not reaching into my bank account to correct someone else's mistake. For the total extra 30 minute round trip, I'll need $10 on top of the initial pay. Thanks gas for being so expensive. No, they say, we'll give you 810. No, I say, I have plans now in 10 minutes that I will have to miss. $8.10 will not cover the gas and wear and tear for the extra 30 minutes. I will need no less than $10 or I will leave them on the curb of the noted delivery address. We'll give you $5 and can't do any more than that, they say. Wait, I say, $5 on top of the additional $8.10 to make it $13.10 on top of what I'm being paid or just $5? I want everything in writing specifically because I knew Shipped was going to do exactly what they did next. Oh yes, 1310, but we can't do any more, they say. Fine, I'm returning it to the store now, I say. Go to the store, do the whole return process, get in contact with Shipped as they directed me to with the requested information. Get a message on my phone from Shipped to the effect of, your order has been canceled and $20.80 issued to your account. What? I contact Shipped, say I'm confused, say it looks as though they were only giving me $5 on top of the original order payment when they said I would be compensated with 1310. I was told, oh, we won't give you any more than five. But you already said, is there someone else I can speak to? Nope, five dollars, take it or leave it. All right, fine. Don't wanna pay me the agreed upon wage? That's a breach of contract, meaning you never actually paid me for this return. So what did I do? I marched right back into the store, asked the worker who had taken the return that she had just gotten done with. I snatched the bag up, strode up to the manager, informed them of what happened, 
and told them since I wasn't being paid to return the groceries, I would be taking them back to the last place I was contracted and paid to deliver them. I told him if he wanted to be recompensated for the groceries, he could charge shipped as they were not willing to pay to have them returned. Message shipped from my car informing them of this and gave them 30 minutes. Yep, my plans were now ruined. It's now two hours later to rescind their ascension and pay me what they actually agreed to and owed me. Had to reach out two separate times because the first girl, despite my being very polite, would not go to anyone else, such as management, to ask for an exception to this policy considering they had literally told me they would pay me more. Actually had the gall to ask if I had taken items I had returned and all I had to say in response was, did you pay me to return them? Second girl was much more helpful. Reached out to her team to see if anything could be done. Shipped still wouldn't be swayed, but I thanked her profusely for at least trying. So in the end, they said they wouldn't do any more than $5. I told them, all right, I reject that offer. Just pay me the original delivery because $5.80 is where they'll be. You can pay another shipped shopper $15 to come get them. Drove back. It was on my way home. Dropped them off and left. I'm not a charity. I don't work for free. And I certainly don't pay to work. I'm going to be messaging ShopRite corporate directly along with New Jersey Labor Board because this is not the first issue with wages I've had with Shift. And honestly, ShopRite should seek compensation from them. Have fun paying for the more than $13.10 of groceries that are now rotting on the curb, Shift. Side note, to anyone who may say you're being entitled, no, I'm not. It's not entitled to expect an agreed upon wage. It's extortion to expect me to work for less than agreed. Imagine you accepted an order from a delivery service, fulfilled that obligation, and suddenly they decided to pay you less than half for that completed order. Or you're working at a job and they suddenly cut your pay without any notice or agreement upon your part. As I explained to them, I never would have returned the groceries for $5 because it wasn't my mistake. Would have returned them no problem if it had been, and I would be paying to return them. Plus the missed plans, plus the lost time. So no, I am in no way in the wrong and I don't care what anyone who thinks otherwise has to say. Karen trashes my Airbnb, gets taught a lesson. My wife and I own a mountain cabin, and a few years ago we decided to put it up as an Airbnb. The place is a remote A-frame on three acres of forested land with awesome views, and it's about 30 minutes from a ski resort. This was our first Airbnb, so we were pretty cautious with everything, like looking at guests' past reviews, asking them about their trip to make sure this place would suit them, etc. Everything was going pretty well until the entitled people booked the whole weekend for Thanksgiving. They told us they were driving out from Texas, mom, dad, three kids, and two dogs. Being that this was our first holiday rental, we went all out for them. We set a turkey to defrost in the fridge for them and left out a snack platter and a couple of bottles of champagne. They arrived Sunday night and the next few days, all heck broke loose. I get a 6 a.m. call Monday morning. The whole family is sick and they're throwing up. They all had altitude sickness. The cabin is at 11,000 feet above sea level, so this happens, especially when you aren't in shape and just came from sea level. I did warn the guests about this ahead of time. So I'm on the phone talking them through everything, where the urgent care is, what to do, etc. By day two, things have calmed down, Tuesday. However, then I take a look at our water cistern gauge, remote monitored. This house has what we call a slow well recovery system. Basically, at some times of the year, the well might only produce around 60 gallons per day instead of the usual 300. So we have a 500-gallon water storage system that helps smooth out the demand curves. Basically, once the tank goes below 40%, the well starts pumping, and if the well goes dry, a timer gets started, and it will pump again in 3 hours until the tank is topped up. This system is more than adequate for 6 guests. Also, the house only has one bathroom and a 40-gallon hot water tank, so it's not like anyone can take long showers. It's all on the listing. It's a rustic place. Tactically speaking, we just ask guests to conserve water, but the system is fully automatic and no one even knows it's there. Well, after 48 hours, I checked our tank monitor and I see it's around 35% full, which means the guests have used all of the storage plus what the well can produce in two days. I'm estimating nearly 700 gallons of water. I literally thought something must be broken because there was no way in heck two parents and three kids could use that much water. Like perhaps the well fuse popped and they got nothing from the well. So I'm now freaking out, thinking this nice family is going to be out of water on Thanksgiving. I called her and politely asked that they conserve water and had them reset the system. 
aka turn the breaker on and off. So I basically said I'd monitor it for three hours and if I didn't see the levels make progress, I'd get water trucked in. This would literally be a first as I've never had to do this. Her response, sounds good, but hurry because we drink a lot of water. How weird of a comment is that? As if five people drinking a gallon a day, max, somehow equates to hundreds of gallons missing from the system. Well, there's really no change in water level after three hours, so I get on the phone to book a water truck. And as it's now one day before Thanksgiving, it's just not happening. So I now need to figure out how to transport water to this house. I live one and a half hours away. I went to Farm and Tractor Supply and I bought a 275 gallon tank that would fit on my truck, plus hoses and pumps. Then I drive up there, figure out where I can buy bulk water from, and I go to the house. I finally get there around 4 p.m. and the guests are out, but gave me permission to go inside and test things out, aka I wanted to make sure the system was working. I went inside and found two huskies in a crate who had gone to the bathroom in their crates. It smelled so gross. The owner said that they would be back and would clean it up. At this point, I've been working on this for 8 hours. I'm sick, it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and I'm now hooking up the transfer pump. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving and I still need to get to my parents' house, thankfully only 30 minutes from the cabin. I start pumping and then I see their car pull up and they're waiting at the bottom of the driveway. Knowing they have kids, I go down and say hi and I let them know that they can go in and I'll be done in about 40 minutes. They started to act real odd at this point, but they go ahead and go inside. Then I saw two more cars on the side of the road around the switchback and it all clicks. The reason I just did all of this work and spent nearly $600 on supplies is because these people had 12 people staying there. If you all are curious as to how I didn't notice when I went inside, I didn't snoop around, I just went straight to the breaker box and then went to the crawl space where the tanks are. Also, the smell from the dogs was just horrid, so I got out as fast as possible. At this point, I went up to the front door, knocked and said, Be honest with me, how many people do you have staying here? Her. Um, nine? I could see she was lying. But even that number was over our legal capacity based on our permit. Me. You realize that this listing is for six people. Her. Well, there are beds for more people and the kids have a crib and we didn't know our family wanted to come when we booked it. The loft does have a pull-out couch, so best case there is sleeping for eight adults. But I'm guessing people were sleeping on the couches as well. Me. I just spent $600 plus a full day to solve a problem that was actually not a problem. Her. Well, the house should have water. Me. The house system was designed and tested for six. The stated number on the listing. I don't know how you think it's okay to have this many people here. Her. We could leave, but it would have to be tomorrow and we expect a refund because we don't want to drive back down these roads in the dark with our kids. It's maybe 6 p.m. at this point. No cell service at the cabin, so I went to town and got in the Wi-Fi at a local bar and I called Airbnb. At this point, I had been hosting for three months and I had no idea how to handle the situation. But now I was more afraid that they would damage something in the house, so Airbnb canceled their reservation and asked them to leave the house. I was able to recover around $200 for a deep cleaning on the house and they didn't get a refund. On a funny note, at the beginning of this year, I started a hot tub service company and water trucking is a service we offer. And I used some of that equipment to get started. Am I the jerk for threatening to divorce my husband for co-signing on a $1 million home that isn't ours? My husband, 38 male, and I, 39 female, have been happily married for a little over two years. We own a home and do quite well for ourselves financially. He generally maintains the finances for our family. My husband's mother and sister live a few hours away and I always felt like they mistreated him. They speak down to him, disrespect him, and essentially make him feel as if it's his responsibility to clean up their financial mishaps and their poor choices. Now onto the story. My husband's sister and mother have been renting a home from another family member well under market value, at least 3,000 less than what it would rent for now. The owner slash family member has decided to sell the home. Mind you, it's been trashed and not maintained by the sister and mother. They have little to no respect for the fact that they've had it so good for so long. The owner gave them 90 days to vacate the premises. Immediately, the sister and mother begin asking my husband to help them buy a home. They live and work in one of the most expensive housing markets in the US. Additionally, they don't qualify for any type of financial assistance that would help them buy a modest home in the area, and they refuse to move to a more affordable area, 
lower credit score, no major assets, etc. After a lot of back and forth, they finally asked my husband to co-sign on a very basic older home that costs $1 million. My immediate reaction was to tell them absolutely not, and I voiced my concerns to my husband. He's usually very level-headed and financially savvy, but I had to be the one to push him and his family for some sort of plan on how this would work. To go from paying $1,000 a month in rent to well over $6,000 a month on a mortgage, not even including bills, seems questionable at best and a terrible decision at worst. I asked my husband why they can't move into a modest apartment and make a plan to buy in a year or two, but he didn't really have an answer but agreed that they absolutely need a plan in order for him to engage. Again, after several weeks of back and forth with his family, they had yet to provide any solid plan on how they would pay the mortgage, bills, and avoid default. Who would be responsible for repairs? No idea. Finally, last week before I left for a work trip, my husband told me that he would not be co-signing on the home and that they had done zero planning. I was so relieved and I was able to relax on my trip. Well, I returned home at the end of the week and was taking a shower when he walks in and tells me that he co-signed for the home. To say I was taken aback is an understatement. I went through all of the range of emotions in a short amount of time, but it wasn't until the next morning that what he had done really got to me. He chose to make a risky investment with people who don't respect him and did it behind my back after assuring me he wouldn't. He kept trying to tell me I was safe from any potential impact, but I don't understand how that could be. I asked him to walk me through the conversation, the plans, and any assurance that our own assets were safe. He couldn't. He then had the audacity to tell me, at least I decided to tell you. That was when I lost it. I felt absolutely betrayed and disrespected. I cried and screamed and told him he can't see how they use him. I told him I was questioning his integrity and our relationship. We're already in the midst of the IVF process and it's been extremely hard on me and my body. I told him I didn't think he deserved to be the father of my kids and if we did have kids, his family would have limited contact and not be allowed around them. There are other incidents of how they've treated me with such disrespect that I have even distanced myself from them. That is also another reason why my husband decided for us to move away from them. Back to the subject. At first, he was remorseful, but then he got defensive of his family, even though myself and many others have tried to tell him how horrible they are. I told him if he wanted any chance of making our relationship right, he was to immediately work with his mother and sister to write a contract that he had majority ownership in the home, so that if they continued to make poor decisions and default, he could sell the house. Well, to no one's surprise, his family would not agree to these terms because they believe living there is enough to solidify it's theirs. For the last three days, I've asked over and over again why he made this drastic decision without a plan. My friends agree that this is a divorce-worthy offense, but the reality is besides this. We have a wonderful life together, and I love him dearly. So, Reddit, am I the jerk for calling my husband stupid and threatening to divorce him over co-signing on the loan? Additional details. His sister is actually older than him, He's managed to keep his financial success fairly well hidden from his family, but due to the cosign process, they now know exactly what assets he has and I'm certain they will expect more from him. Before asking my husband to cosign, they didn't even attempt to take out the loan for the home on their own. I assume they expect that having him on the loan will give them the choice to destroy the home or default on the loan because he will pay in order to not mess up his own credit and assets. His family does not care for me and are likely jealous at the life I have with my husband and how they get less from him. Though my husband maintains the finances, we bring in roughly the same in income, so this is not a case of my husband having full control. Not the jerk. He's just committed you and your family, consisting right now of you and your husband, to a $1 million debt and an asset he has absolutely no ownership stake in. This is not an investment. It's assuming the responsibility of paying for their house. It's grossly irresponsible on his part, and here's the worst part. Your husband has incurred a debt. In many states, California and New York included, and I'm assuming that's where this home is, debt is a community property. If you go out and finance a car, your husband is responsible for half that debt, whether he signed on the dotted line or not. Put another way, if your husband passed tomorrow, you would still be on the hook for that mortgage. This was a historically bad decision on his part. You need to be contacting an attorney to protect yourself, to say absolutely nothing of a community property assets you and your husband own. In the event of a divorce, barring an incredibly generous act from your husband, your combined net worth just effectively declined by $1 million, unless he accepts full and unconditional responsibility for the debt during divorce proceedings. 
He royally did you both over with this. Not the jerk. He's shown you that he's irresponsible. What happens if you have a college fund for your kid and his family feels entitled? Please do not have a kid with him. Unless he could somehow get out of this mess and go no contact with them, I would definitely divorce him. Even then, I don't see how we could rebuild trust. I would have to go through every single account monthly. I don't know if it's worth it. The blatant lie and then doing it behind her back. How on earth do you get past that? If they divorce now, then this stays with him. He just lost their retirement and college fund, just gave it away and will most likely keep on doing it. It's a million dollars, worth zero equity for him. OP, I'm sorry you had trouble conceiving, but I'm glad that you're not tied by a kid to this mess. Not the jerk. Would I be the jerk if I hire a nanny to help with childcare after my wife got a new job? My wife, who's 36, and I, 38 male, have been married for 12 years and we have three kids who are 9, 6, and 4. We both work full-time, with me being the primary breadwinner and earning about three times what she does. About four months ago, she was offered a promotion at her job. It wasn't a big step up in pay, but would be a lot more responsibility as well as being on call three to four nights a week. When she told me about it, she was really excited and acting like it was some huge opportunity to advance her career. I was happy for her, but I told her I had some concerns about how often she would be out of the house in the evenings and or how we would have to alter our schedules and routines due to her being on call. She assured me that being on call wasn't an issue and reiterated that she would be compensated for that time even if she wasn't actually called in. I told her that ultimately it was her decision, but I feel like we live comfortably already and the little extra money wouldn't be worth the hassle it would cause in our lives. She ended up taking the job and wouldn't you know it, she ended up being called in about 50% of the time. This resulted in us having to find alternate rides for our kids to do activities, canceling plans, her leaving in the middle of dinner or family time, etc. I also had to pick up a lot of slack in terms of household duties and childcare. We've never fought as much as we have been since she took this promotion, but she's convinced it's a stepping stone to something better. I floated the idea of hiring a nanny for the nights she's on call so that I have help in the inevitable situation where she gets called in again. Simply having another person to watch the kids if I need to take one of them to an activity or a play date, or to be able to make dinner easier or get other chores done. She shot the idea down immediately and told me that me picking up her slack is not that big of a deal and I should be able to handle it. After a three-week stretch of her being called in three nights a week, I told her that I was going to start looking into nannies, with or without her agreement. I told her the only way I would reconsider is if she tries to get her old job back or look for a different one because her promotion is not working for me or the kids. She did not take this well. She accused me of being a lazy parent and trying to buy my way out of being a father. She also said that the cost of a nanny would offset any extra money her promotion is bringing in. When I told her it would actually cost more than that, she got extra upset. She has no time frame for how long she will be in this position at work and apparently has no care for my feelings on this. I'm tempted to just hire a nanny anyway because this is not sustainable for me. I think this promotion has blinded her to how negatively it has impacted the rest of the family and I refuse to just suck it up any longer. Edit. Because so many people seem to be operating under the false assumption that my wife did 100% of the childcare and chores before her promotion. I feel the need to clarify. Before her promotion, we would divide and conquer and split childcare and chores as evenly as possible. Both of us were 100% comfortable with how we had these things divided between us. It's not like I was coming home, demanding to know what was for dinner, cracking a beer and sitting on the couch until I fell asleep. I don't understand why you need a nanny for three nights a week if you're home. The tone of this reads as you not being supportive and pushing these kinds of issues not necessarily because you're actually feeling overwhelmed. You don't actually talk about that at all. You just say you want someone just in case one of the kids has an appointment, but because you resent her trying to advance in her career and are trying to make some kind of point about how it's an inconvenience. I might be misreading the situation, but none of this sounds healthy, and what she's doing doesn't sound unreasonable. You're the jerk, unless you're leaving out some significant stuff. Not the jerk. Coming from someone who has a spouse with an on-call job, we had three kids, and it frequently came up, at least two had activities on the same time in opposite directions, and husband was called in or stuck at work. If it hadn't been for my parents living close that could help out, we would have had to cut out other activities for our kids because it was impossible to be at all of the activities at the same time. OP. Our oldest two play hockey and their practices are in the evening, never at the same time and sometimes not even in the same rink. Coordinating rides for them has been the primary source of me wanting a nanny. 
I'm asking a lot of favors from other parents and I don't want to take advantage of anyone. There has been at least three times when my wife took one kid to practice and had to leave to go to work during practice. Obviously, she got a ride for the kid before she left, but she doesn't see this as an issue nearly as much as I do. You're the jerk, but not for what you think you might be. Support your wife. You're talking crap about her new job. It's probably not the money that's mostly driving her. You clearly believe your work is superior and there's no way she doesn't know that. Where I disagree with your framing is that he's not telling her to quit. He's telling her that a nanny would fix the problem. He's even willing to lose money to make the household run with a nanny as opposed to saying she needs to quit. I think his proposal is fine. The issue is his tone and how he talks about his wife's career. He clearly has a lot of resentment over it and doesn't seem to be approaching supporting her with a healthy attitude. He's being realistic. If your career puts a burden on the family, it's absolutely fair to question whether it's worth the money. Comment section full of you're the jerks as expected. Whenever moms complain about picking up the husband's slack and needing help with childcare, they're fully supported and even recommended counseling to deal with the stress. Not the jerk OP. Your wife said, this is happening and you're going to find a way to be okay with it. Burnout is real and no joke. Hire help. I can't believe all the you're the jerk responses. Some are clearly not reading the part where you explained about hockey practice. If the gender roles were reversed, I have a feeling that it would be a different tune. Hire the nanny, it will benefit the kids. Hire the nanny anyway. It's a win-win. She keeps her stepping stone to a better job and your kids don't fall through the cracks. When her better job comes through, presumably with better pay, all this will be worth it. But while her on-call at random times job is what she's doing, your kids should not have to suffer because it's more than you can juggle. Not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. This guy won't leave me alone and I'm terrified. It's midnight and I'm up in my apartment wide awake and crying with no one awake to talk to, so I decided to make my first Reddit account. I'm 23 female. I moved to a new city about 8 months ago to try and pursue some childhood dreams. Family is 5 hours away and we don't have a good relationship. I don't have a single close friend yet here because I've just been really focused on getting settled in and getting used to my job and college and all of that. I'm working as a waitress and a bartender. I work at this small restaurant and I work nights to work with my school schedule. Weekday nights are pretty dead and I start at 4pm. I had a regular guy that came in every night, really nice guy, always tipped well and always complimented me. After a few months he asked me out, but he's 38 and I politely told him, hey, you're a super sweet guy and you'll find a great girl, but I'm not interested in that big of an age gap. I never reject people in a mean way. I would never want to hurt anyone, but that age gap for me is like 10 years too much. And he started bringing me treats, coffee, flowers over the next little while, and every time I asked him not to, I was really firm in telling him no. He came to my apartment building, which I never gave him my address, so either he went in my wallet or followed me home, I don't know. But it was terrifying. I told him to leave, and I thought he did. It was right after I got done with school. After an hour went by, I went down to leave for work, and he was waiting at my car in the parking lot. I tried to talk to him normally, out of pure fear, because we were the only ones down there, and he was not nice in the slightest. It was like talking to a different person, and that was two weeks ago. He's not allowed at my work or apartment. I blocked him on everything, because that experience gave me such bad vibes. I genuinely didn't feel safe at that moment. If a group of people didn't come by down in the elevator, that is. A few days after this, I found an air tag slipped in a small pocket of my purse. I can't prove it was him, but I'm assuming probably one time when he was the only one in the restaurant and went in the back and I had left my stuff out. He followed me on Instagram when we first met, and I have pictures with my two closest friends from high school who still live in another country now. They got weird messages from a fake account claiming to be me asking if I ever gave them any of my passwords because I was locked out of all my accounts. Again, I can't prove it was him, but that struck me as extremely odd. Today, I walked up to my friend at school who I study with every day and he's like, hey, I didn't know you had a boyfriend. He was just in here looking for you. And then told me that he was also told to stay away from me. My heart dropped because I know exactly who it was. I was really hoping that would be the end of it, but now I don't know what to do at all. Update. I have a safe place to stay. I called my ex-boyfriend and he told me to come stay with him. His apartment has way higher security than mine and there's no way anyone who doesn't live there can access the parking lot, which is where he kept waiting for me, so that's a huge thing. 
Since he was coming to my school, I'm doing most of my classes online. I have two in-person classes on Thursday, but my ex is going to drop me off and pick me up after. They already had an interaction after class yesterday, and Stalker wasn't so tough anymore when he saw my ex get out of the car. He backed down pretty fast. So really, really praying that was enough to keep him away from me. I never told him about my ex being in the city because I didn't really think about it. When I met him, I told him that I didn't know a single person and I think he thought that would help him in what he was trying to do. I also just had to quit my job. It wasn't worth the risk and I'll be able to find another serving job somewhere else. Yes, police were called already, but I didn't have enough proof of real threats and he hadn't done anything yet. So, although he was forced to leave the premises, police couldn't do much. I don't know whether or not he's found where I'm staying yet, but hopefully he's too intimidated to ever try to come to my ex's apartment. My ex has more than one car as well, which is a blessing, because mine is bright pink, so very easy to spot. I've been driving his. This whole thing sucks. I hate staying home. I also hate not working. I'm really lucky that my ex I haven't seen since we were 19 is helping me though. Got blessed with that one. Been almost four years, and we're already best friends again. Okay, first of all, this is terrifying. It's also infuriating. I'm really glad that her ex is a cool dude and is helping her out. It upsets me that law enforcement is so useless with things like this. Am I the jerk for repossessing a kid's horses? Due to a risk of losing our ranch, I sold some horses to an 18-year-old. She came over and picked five to six horses she liked, but after seeing the price total, she decided on two of them. One was a year old and the other was three months old. She said she could make payments on them and I agreed. When she said she wanted to take them whilst she was paying them off, I was very apprehensive, but because her family was friends with ours, I told her that we could do that. She also took the mom who was nursing the baby to borrow until he was weaned. When she came to get them, after they were loaded, I asked her for the deposit and she said she didn't have it yet, but could get it to me by the end of the week. It didn't feel right in my gut, but they were loaded and ready to go. That night, I get a message that she put them in with her horses, who already had an established pecking order, and my younger horse got attacked and hurt by one of hers. It needed stitches and vet attention ASAP. Instead, she put a pad and tape on it. I insisted she call a vet, and she asked if I would call mine and pay for it, and she'd pay me back. Vet came out in the morning, said it was too late to stitch, and had to remove about an adult hand size of detached tissue. We paid for the vet, and when she said she was too squeamish for band-aid changes, I came and did them myself and paid for the supplies. I also had to bring my farrier out and pay him to do their feet because she didn't have the money. Almost a month goes by, zero payments. I notice the three-month-old is getting sick and I tell her I'm just going to come get the horses back and that way they can get the medical care that they need. They refuse. I try to reason with them and no resolution is reached. The cult is showing symptoms of a very serious disease that could end him. I call the sheriff and have him come moderate so I can reason with her to get them back. I compromised by taking the mom and the baby back, getting reimbursed for the vet bill, and I left the yearling there to be paid off. I'm conflicted. Some are calling me the jerk for taking them. Some are calling me the jerk for leaving the yearling behind, and some think I did the right thing. So, am I the jerk here? Edit. For everyone asking why I didn't take the yearling back, the sheriff told me it was a civil matter, and legally, I would need a court order to get them back. The foal was in a life-threatening state, so compromising on the yearling was the only way to convince her to let me take him home right away. If she'd put her foot down, then I would have to wait for the courts to issue an order for me to get all of them back, and by then, it would be too late for the baby. Not the jerk. If this jerk can't properly take care of the horses or pay for them, she doesn't deserve them. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.